That's what we call the rat life. It's death by debt. It's a life of perpetual sleep. I see the light inside you. And here, why it turns orange? I'm not orange. I'm white. <laughs> well, when this color figures that it figures itself out, here we go. So it's been a minute. It's been three weeks. This is book number 21, and I purposely chose to not to. Uh, groom. No, I, I groom, but you can see the, the lovely scrub. I'm under the weather, thus the delay in this lecture. But it's been three weeks and we've gone through a lot of updates. My ears are like super ringing. So you're seeing the worst of the worst, and I don't like the Zoompa Loompa orange, so I'm gonna try to see if I can just maybe. It's not that I have a fever, but I'm not completely well. <laughs> I don't know how we're gonna get through this, but we're gonna try. Um, book number 21, Rich Dad Poor Dad. I remember the first time I read this. I was in Croatia, and I remember it was just like, oh my God, this is the best book ever. And I didn't get that same feeling the second time around because I had absorbed all of the basic, basic building blocks of the foundation that is financial literacy. Um, and so it wasn't as exciting to read this time around, but it was definitely a very, very, very good refresher. The reason that I loved it so much the first time that I read it was because it articulates what the rat life is so well. And it makes it so simple that it's just like, oh wow, this makes complete sense. And we've talked about it before, but the, the biggest prison, or the, the best prison, is the one that you don't know you're in. So everyone who's living the rat life, right? Who's never escaped the rat life, who's never pursued entrepreneurship, started their own business, left their nine to five, they have no idea the trap that they're in. They, and it's just because they've never done the math. So I wanted to do the math at the very start of this lecture, but I don't want to remain orange. <laughs> so I'm wondering if I should turn these lights off or if I should just back up and then zoom in. What do you guys think? I don't know. but. I don't like that I'm orange here. <laughs> I'm white, I'm not this tan. Here's the math, you ready? I wrote it down because I just want you guys to get an idea of how hard you get fucked by ignorance. The cost of ignorance, okay? I have right now, as it stands, my car that I financed, right? The remaining balance on the note is, is just over $13,600, right? That's the sticker price that they sell you on. Here's your mortgage, $500,000, 6% interest rate over 30 years fixed rate, right? That's the sticker price. And some of you guys watching this, oh, I locked in my mortgage at 2.75. Shut the hell up. <laughs> but I did the math because when I get paid, right, then I put in my car payment, okay? And then out of the my car payment, because I got it on horrific credit, right, because I was living in my car at the time with maxed out credit cards. And when I was thinking about what I was gonna say for this lecture, when I say maxed out credit cards, the limit was $500. The other limit was $1,000 at the time. And so they were maxed out, right? Because I was just trying not to die. And out of that $304, which is my super high interest car payment, the balance I noticed would go down by $175. I said, that's fascinating. And so $129 of that, that I've paid into it, where does it go? It goes to the bank, but it goes sheerly to what they call interest. It's a nice way of saying we take your money for free. <laughs> and so I did the math. And I put $313,600, which is the car note, divided by $175, which is what actually gets paid down, equals 77 months until that's paid in full, right? That's six years. And then I went one step further, which is what no one ever does. And I asked myself, how much in the totality of my payments would I have put towards the car that only has a $13,600 balance? The answer, $23,625 in total. What does that mean? That means over 10 grand will have gone just to interest on a debt that gets perpetuated six fucking years, right? And that's one thing. That's one item. That's just your car that you need for your rat life job. 
to get to work. Does that include car insurance? No. Does that include gas? No. Does that include the registration that they charge you each year, which is just another tax? No. Does that include your student loans? No. Does that include interest that accrues under your student loans? No. Does that include your mortgage? What about your PMI? Because PMI is a required, they call it insurance, required payment, just another tax, if you don't pay off 20% of the equity up front of the house. So you have to pay what's called PMI. If you don't pay 20% of the value of the home until you've done that, you owe PMI. You have homeowner's insurance on top of that. You have property tax on top of that. That doesn't include your utilities, your electricity bill, your gas, your, your sewer, trash, water, heat. Doesn't include any of that shit, your internet. Then there's credit cards, which right now are over 20% on average, over 20% interest. My car has, it's a very shitty interest rate, but I think it's like between 10 and 13%, which is horrific. But interest rate on credit cards right now is between 20 and 20, like four or 29%. Meaning the math that we did that perpetuates a car payment, a car note for six years, that can be doubled for people's credit card balances, right? That have interest accruing on those. So do you see how all of this ties in, right? So all of a sudden you're in the rat life. You're, you're, all debt is, is slavery but they sell you on the sticker price, right? This is just $13,600, no problem, sign right here. When you do the math, wait a second, this is $23,625. It's gonna perpetuate for six years if I don't put a greater sum every single month or just do fat chunks to pay off the principal, otherwise I'm getting raped by interest. And you can apply that to your student loans, to your mortgage, to your, the car that you're financing, to your credit cards. When you compound all of those, right? And we talked about the PMI that you also have on your mortgage, the homeowner's insurance, the property tax, the gas bill, the electricity bill, the utility bill, the sewer, water, trash, internet. Then you have your gym membership, right? Then you have your phone bill. And then what else do you have? I put gym, phone, gas, food. You have health insurance, car insurance. And that's before any of your entertainment bullshit. That's before your Netflix subscription, your Amazon Prime, your, your, your Disney Plus, any of that garbage. That's before any of your entertainment, right? That's before any of your restaurants. That's before any of that shit. And that's before any family. This is just one fucking person. Okay. That's what we call the rat life. It's death by debt. It's a life of perpetual slavery. Okay. That's the beauty of this book. If you want to stop the video right here, you can. That's the synopsis of it. The best homework takeaways from this is doing the audit. What is your actual balance? How negative actually are you? I did the math and I'm gonna go over it. I'm gonna be very candid in this video of what my income is, of what my overhead expenses are, and what my expected time horizon is to get to zero. Not to get to have 10K saved, 100K saved, no. To get to fucking zero, what does that mean? When I finally have dug out of this trap, what they call the rat race, right? The rat life. So I wanted to preface this with that math because, and I, I apologize that this keeps switching into fucking Oompa Loompa orange. <sighs> what can I do, huh? I, what, what can I do here? <laughs> so, but it's so important that you guys do the math on your own. As in you look at what your overhead expenses are. You look at all of your outstanding debt balances and actually have perspicacity. As in don't just pay the minimum sum blindly. Say, okay, this is what I'm paying. How much is that balance actually going down? And then doing the audit of what are your overhead expenses? And then you'll actually be like, wait, if I'm making this much and I'm spending this much per month, that's called debt, that, that gap, okay? Or if you, this is your overhead and this is what your income is, well, that's still, sorry. If this is what your, <laughs> your income is and this is what your overhead is, look at that tiny fucking margin. But you won't even know that you have this margin if you don't do the math on how much you're actually spending on all of your overhead expenses per month. Most people don't know. Most people don't know how much they spend on anything. They just wait till the end of the month and then whatever they're short by, they just put it on debt, right? And then they repeat that shit over and over and over 
and whenever they have a little gap, right, because they feel so stressed and depressed and they're like, man, I just need a break, then they spend that shit on a festival, on a flight that they can't afford, right? That's how you perpetuate your slavery for fucking ever. To where you have to be like me right now, going through just a season of no, just a season of fuck off, just a season of no, no, I don't give a shit about this, 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 this. It's a distraction from my freedom, right? So with that, that's how I wanted to start this lecture. I wanted to plant that seed. I was reading this book for the first time ever when I was in Croatia in 2021. And it just blew my mind with how well it articulated with a rat like this. Cut forward to today, after all the trials and tribulations from living in my car, from failing in entrepreneurship, from returning to the rat life, I have such a greater perspective, such a greater degree of my newfound lens of how I can now view the game, how I can now play the game to win. And when I say win, it's to be free. You know, at the end of the day, that's all we're doing. And I think the, the candor and the honesty and the full transparency will give you guys the courage to look at your situation because it's like when I used to train people for physical transformations. Nobody wants to look at themselves where they are. Like nobody wants to take, you know, the before photo. Nobody wants to take their shirt off and look how, what a fat piece of shit that they are. Because when you do that, when you look at yourself exactly where you are, you have to take ownership and responsibility that this is your fault. And it's the same with finances. This is why most people don't look at their bank balance. They don't look at their outstanding credit card debt and they sort of sweep it under the rug or their check just to make sure they're not in overdraft, right? And then they'll just, you know, pay down the minimum payment, minimum payment. They don't have a plan for getting the fuck out of their debt, which is their slavery, right? It's what's keeping you bound, right? It's where you can't live a life of freedom. The number one cause for divorce is financial problems. It's the number one cause. The number one cause of people's stress and anxiety and worry and concern are fucking bills from their slavery, from their rat life, from buying shit they don't need, dude. From constantly saying yes to people. Yeah, I'll go to this birthday thing. Yeah, I'll do this. It's just, it's, it's just, it perpetuates your slavery forever. So until you do the math, until you actually like break it down and you're honest, Okay, this is where I'm at. Okay, this is how long it's gonna take me if, I'm, if I just keep to this budget. And if I'm not getting any other sources of income, I have to do this shit for fucking years because I did the math a couple months ago where I was looking at the interest that's accruing on this credit card, on this credit card, on this credit card. And I was just like, you're getting bled so fucking heavily. You're getting financially raped from neglecting to just full force these outstanding debts, right? So with that, I think I'm gonna turn on the AC because I'm getting hot talking, and then hopefully the pause will turn me into a uh, Caucasian dark, and then we'll begin this lecture, here we go. We're rolling with it, I can't figure it out. So here we go. So I wanted to start with that math problem um, because I think it'll give you guys the best cognizance of doing the math. You don't know that you're in the rat life until you've done the math, and then you're just like, wow, if I continue down this path, I will be a slave forever. So when was the last time you've done it? When was the last time you had the courage to look at yourself in the mirror, honestly, where you are right now? Most people never do that. Most people don't like to look at themselves with their shirt off, taking a snapshot, this is my current. The beauty about it is, if you understand that this too shall pass, that this is temporary, that yes, it's full ownership, it's full responsibility, it's full accountability, that this is your fault, but it gives you the power to change. To say, yeah, the past, my past financial spending, my past financial neglect, my past, my past financial illiteracy, my fault. But you know what? I'm gonna take ownership, I'm gonna take accountability, and now I'm gonna put myself on this path for freedom forever. So you know what? What's to come, that's my fault too. Here we go. Book number 21, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Amazing book on the foundation of financial literacy. See, I'm right over here, so we're gonna stand right fucking here. <laughs> this is exactly the color that I want. Okay, so I'm just not gonna move. <laughs> um, for example, the one dad have, had a habit of saying, I can't afford it. The other dad forbade those words to be used. He insisted, I ask, how can I afford it? The question forces you to think, puts your brain to work, I can't equals your brain stops working, it won't even attempt to try. It's very, very true. And that was one of the insights I got the first time that I read this back in 2021, is 
Brian Tracy also talks about it in um, Eat That Frog. If you say, I can't, I can't, I can't, your mind doesn't even go to work to try. The way that you harness the power of your mind to help you achieve your goal, to harness the power of your reticular activating system, to work, to go to work, even subconsciously, even while you're asleep, is by shifting the dialogue. That's why words matter. I can't, I can't, I can't. You'll prove the, your, your mind will be like, okay, no problem. Based on your belief system, I'm not even going to try because why expend energy needlessly if you've deemed by your value and belief system it's not possible? Why go through the effort of even trying? Oh, that's right, it won't. Versus when you say, how can I? Then you, your creativity kicks in, your mind starts going to work even while you're asleep trying to pinpoint how you can get to this destination but you don't even open up that possibility. If based on your identity, your belief system, your values, you, you deemed the narrative, I can't do blank. Good quote. The only, the only thing stopping you from achieving your goal is the bullshit story you keep telling yourself as to why you can't. If you ever listen to someone in their story, they have a limiting belief. I can't do this because of this. Just the other day, I, was, I had an amazing four hour conversation, which is part of the reason why I'm sick. This guy got me sick. And, I was coaching him through his relationship problems and he kept using the narrative, that's just the way she's wired. That's just the way she's wired. That's just how I'm wired. And I said, you gotta cut that shit out. And he was like, what do you mean? I said, every time you say, that's just how she's wired, you're rationalizing her behavior. And I said, I'm wired to do this, to do that, blah, blah, blah. Who gives a shit how I'm wired? I still do blank, right? I'm wired to sleep in, right? I still get the fuck up, <laughs> right? I'm wired as a dominant masculine, we'll call it alpha male, to act a certain way, right? And yet I control my natural instincts, right? I'm wired this way, and yet I don't, you know, pillage like the Vikings did. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Like, and then when he would say it to himself, I said, no, no, that's a limiting belief. That's just how I'm wired. No, no, that's just your behavior up until now, right? You can choose to show up to the gym on the days you, you don't want to. I, I'm just not wired to, to train, or I'm just not wired, here's a good example, because I was working to help him develop his lack of tolerance for disrespect, as in he has a history of uh, tolerating a lot of disrespect. So I was coaching him through the idea that a woman can't respect you when she gives you opportunity after opportunity to not tolerate disrespect that you choose to tolerate, right? How can I respect a man who, t who chooses to tolerate uh, disrespect as the woman? Oh, that's right, I can't. Oh, that's how you're wired to tolerate the disrespect. No, no, it's a choice. And it's just your habit up until this point. And so these are the results that you're getting because of your actions. You're conditioning her behavior. There's a reason why she left. There's a reason why she's sleeping with other guys, right? Your fault, your fault, your decisions, your actions. The way that you can counter out, counter out, counteract that is by pattern recognition, right? And I gave him a good example. And I said, I used to be very indecisive in my communication to women because I didn't give a shit about the activity. I just wanted their time and to spend time with them. So I would always ask, hey, what do you want to do? Hey, are you free here? Hey, where do you want to go? Because I could not care less what the thing was. Unbeknownst to me, I was conditioning the behavior for them to be the provider, for them to be the one who had to take the leadership, to who had to make the decision, who had to take the lead, right? From my indecision, right? I was conditioning them to view me as an ineffective, incompetent, incapable leader from a lack of decisiveness, right? But that's just how I'm wired. No, no. It's you haven't practiced, you haven't refined, you haven't implemented decisive speech in communication to your partner or prospective partner whom you are presuming to lead. Does that make sense? The whole idea is we have limiting beliefs, we have stories, we have bullshit ideologies that we tell ourselves 
of why we can't achieve a goal, of why we can't, you know, of why this relationship didn't work out, of this person's behavior, of your neglect. There's a noise outside. It sounds like the laundry machine's going off. Okay, then it's not. Um, does that make sense? It's all the importance of your language. So when you say something as silly as I can't, your mind won't even try. It won't even go to work to attempt to because you've deemed it not possible. So why bother expending the effort, okay? So the way that you fix that is by changing your rhetoric, changing your verbose, changing your oratory, right? The narrative, your, your language, your dialogue. How can I do this? So homework assignment, I thought I already did this before. I, I know I did this before, but it should be, you should remove the words I can't from your vocabulary. That, that should never even cross your mind to say, I can't do blank because it's bullshit. Because it's an ex it's, it presupposes an excuse or a limiting belief. No, no. Instead of you saying, I can't, try saying it's not a priority. Try saying, I don't want to. Try saying, I would rather be a slave than focus on developing my financial literacy. Right? I can't afford it. People would say that shit all the time. You know, I don't want to be wealthy. I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be this. Like, no, you don't want to fucking do the work required to be those things. So shut the hell up. And it's the same thing with people who say, I don't want to travel. I don't want to do this. It's like, no, no, you can't, period. And I know that, you know, <laughs> contrast what I just said from saying you can't, but I mean, they, they quite literally can't from their financial position. They can't quit their job. They can't, they've positioned themselves to where, they're reliant on their enslavement, right? And so they use those cop they use those guises, those facades, but they're only lying to themselves. So the encouragement, the food for thought, food for consideration from the jump is be very particular, be very aware of your language when you say things like, I can't, right? Instead, challenge yourself if you have the humility to say, it's not a priority. It works with dating too. If you're dating with someone and if they ever say, I'll give you a perfect example. If you're talking with someone and they never, if you say, hey, are you free here? And they say no, they don't want to spend time with you. But if they say no, but I'm free here, right? It means then they're actually just preoccupied here and they do want to spend time with you at a later date. As in, if they wanted to, they would. <laughs> and this works for guys and girls. The fact is it's not a priority. In modern day dating, they got a roster and the truth be told, you're not high enough on that, on that bench because <laughs> I don't want to get into that with this book, but you understand that, that concept, that idea. As in, if you were a priority, they would what? Make the time. There's no such thing as I can't. There's no such thing as I don't have time. No, it's not a priority. Okay. But that, that works for yourself too. Don't make bullshit excuses that you know are lies, right? Don't say I can't afford it. Say, I can't afford it yet. How can I afford it? It's not in my budget at this time, right? Become the creator of your life by taking responsibility, ownership, taking power of your language, right? Your thoughts, your words, they equal your reality. When you say, I can't, you'll prove that. You'll prove that you can't, right? It's called confirmation bias, right? I can't do this. Your mind, no problem. I'll prove that to be true because your mind, your body, you as a person, you will do anything, whether you know it consciously or subconsciously within your actions to align with your identity. If you're like, I'm Tarek Houks, a man who can't do blank, right? My mind will go to work to prove that because that's my identity, right? We will do anything to be in alignment with who we say we are, okay? I'm moving on because I've hammered that point, I hope home, next. Yeah, I put your language, your identity, your destiny. Say things like, I'm a rich man, even when you're flat broke. There's a difference between being poor and being broke. I had a chick, and it's very unfortunate, um, who, she's the lesbian partner of somebody who used to be a really good friend of mine. And she DM'd me because I posted a supporting picture of Donald Trump. And she was like, I don't know why poor people support him, and insinuating that I'm poor. And that, it, it, number one, I felt, sh uh, not shame, I felt, uh, I felt pity for her wife because that's who her partner is. And it's, I, I know where relationships like, like that end. And it's, 
it's very unfortunate. I feel very bad for her, her name's my friend Carrie. And she has such a shitty partner. But um, Arnold Schwarzenegger did a great video. He said, I was never poor. He said, when I was young, he said we were, we were poor because I didn't have things, right? We didn't have a TV, we didn't have a refrigerator, we had nothing as kids. He said, but I wasn't poor, I was rich because I had a vision, right? And there's such a difference. Being broke is just a circumstance of your current condition. It's just a circumstance of the pocket, right? But if you ever have deemed yourself poor, that's a mindset, do you know what I'm saying? But yeah, most people go through their life with a very poor outlook, a very poor mentality, a very poor mindset. They're not just broke fiscally, they're poor mentally, they're poor emotionally, they're poor spiritually, relationally, physically, right? There's such a big difference, and this is the power of your language. Start to take inventory, start to consider these things as they apply to you. Next. There's a really good quote in the book. It's from the poem by Robert Frost, Two Roads Diverge in a, in a, in a Forest. Two roads diverge in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by and that made all the difference. I think the one who, after watching this lecture, takes the road that's less traveled by is the one that just does the audit, the honest audit of where they are financially, right? Most people never do, why? Because they're just afraid to look at where they are right now honestly. Because it takes a lot of courage to say, I fucked up, right? That I made this mistake, that I bought into this bullshit, you know? And don't get me wrong, dude, I'm a victim of that. I was raised in a Middle Eastern household where if you didn't pursue, you know, the path of becoming an engineer or a doctor um, or a like, a, like a science scientist, any one of those physical sciences, then you were a loser, right? Then you were a failure. Then you were a shame. You brought shame to your, to your dynasty, to your lineage, to your family. Um, so I'm very grateful that that garbage, those, that poison was removed you know, from my life in, in the form of a divorce from my, from my parents. But those were ideologies, those you know, poisonous seeds that were instilled with, within me at a young age that perpetuated even until I was in college to where I pursued physiological science as my undergraduate major before switching to classics. And so I went down the university route and so I assumed the student loans. So I fell into that bullshit trap, right? I fortunately didn't buy into the single unit mortgage trap that a lot of people find themselves in today. As in, people who own a mortgage and then you know, they're, they're boasting about their, their equity that they might have in their property, they consider it an asset, once, and the reality is like, you can't go anywhere. And with where interest rates are at right now, you know, you're not even selling your place because you can't find another one that matches the interest rate that you're paying for now. So you don't have freedom, you're stuck there. and. That's a higher level of wisdom, is learning from other people's mistakes, not just from your own, right? Learning by your own trial and error, that's this level of intelligence. Learning from other people's mistakes and not having to fucking touch the stove because you can see somebody else that touched the stove and found out it was hot, that's real wisdom. And that's how you can expedite years of not needing to do trial and error because you have the humility to accept that somebody else did the trial and error for you. You could save a decade that way. And I've tried to give other people that gift of foresight, of anticipation, including the four hour conversation that got me under the weather. And I told him in my lifetime of healing people, right? Of planting trees under your shade, I'll never sit. I have never seen one person. And I challenged him to be the first. I said, I've never seen one person who knew everything that I was saying was true, who took the courageous action and didn't need to learn the hard way. I said, I've never seen it once. And that's the reality, is most people don't learn unless they learn the hard way, right? They have to get fucking wrecked. They have to go through the heartbreak. They have to, their stupidity and ignorance and arrogance, it's just, it's not enough for it to be, they don't have the humility for that to subside, for them to take words and conceptual knowledge and absorb that and then preemptively save them from the pain they have to experience the the wreckage themselves and it's that idea that we talked about and i brought it here meditations as in truth cannot be heard it can only be seen right truth is seldom heard it's omnipresent when it is seen 
as in you can't tell somebody the truth, you can only show them and help them discover the truth for themselves. And that's what I did with this, you know, gentleman on the path. So, but I love that idea of two roads diverging in a wood. And so it's asking yourself which one, you know, are you gonna walk? Because I feel like anybody who's enrolled in this university, they walk the path of the greatest resistance, right? The path of least resistance that everybody else walks through, that's the sheep of, of, of life. Right? The sheep, sheeps, that's sheep, sheep is plural. The sheep of life, right? They follow the dogma. They follow what everyone else is doing. They follow the blueprint. I'm gonna go to school, I'm gonna get a job, I'm gonna climb the corporate ladder, I'm gonna get my mortgage 30 fucking years. And then, you know, 40 years from now, after being a slave all my life, then that's when I'm gonna be free. Versus the one where it's like, no, let me just do five years of work Enough. so I can be free forever, right? That's the path of the greatest resistance. That's the path of the greatest growth, right? Do you find growth in the absence of comfort or in the in comfort, right? You find growth in the absence of comfort, right? In discomfort. That's the requirement, that's the contingency. That's the needed catalyst to elicit growth. People don't want to go through that path because it's so painful, right? People don't want to start over. People who are working their rat-like job, that's their greatest fear. Starting over or looking less than. Because right now you have a made-up title. So you have status in your little rat-like office amongst your little rat-like friends, right? People don't want the, people don't have the humility to take a pay cut to do what actually makes that happy, right? So I would encourage you guys to have the courage to pursue, to take the path less traveled by, and as Robert Frost says, and that has made all the difference. You know, you but you only have one life, so it's up to you how you wanna live it, if you wanna live it like a slave, like a rat, in the wheel, or if you wanna be free. I know what I wanna do, I know where I'm going, I know what I'm doing. It's every day working to save your own life to be free forever, because what the fuck is the alternative? Speaking of profanity, we need to curb it, because another insight that I had, and another reason for the delay. So there was a lot of things that happened this past week before I continue on the notes. Number one was I fell under the weather. Number two was I was given sight. And on your hero's journey, I wrote this in the, the book that I'm writing, you'll be given sight when you have the resolve that you're not gonna give up. It's as if nature, God, the universe, they smile on you. Because of that quote by Jim Rohn, when a man is resolved, it's, a, it's as if the universe and fate, they hold a conference, they conspire, as if to say, we best step aside for we are powerless against this kind of resolve. So you're given a gift on your hero's journey. Just like, remember when Frodo was attacked by that spider and then Lady Galadriel shows up, right? And then she offers him that light, right? That's the equivalent of you on your hero's journey being given a gift, a quest item, if you will. Now, not in the Lord of the Rings realm, right? Mordor in the Shire. IRL, <laughs> we're given a gift to continue on our hero's journey in the form of a thought, an insight, an idea, right? That's not your own, you're not, you know, you don't have this this intelligence yourself now. It's it's given to you by nature, by the universe, divine intelligence, grace, God, whatever it is that you believe, right? The insight that I had was, what if we focus the season on all that we can give, not all that we can get? And so I made a list of all, I was like, what else can I do, right? For me getting to the next level of my rat life progression, which right now I work as my title as executive assistant to the assistant superintendent. My goal is to, the promotion that I've been vying for for the past year and a half, that had failure after failure after failure trying to get, has been to be the right hand of the superintendent of a school district. Because if I can shadow the guru, which is kinesthetic learning, something we're gonna go over right now is how you have the greatest retention when it comes to learning. Then I can learn how to run a school district myself. Then I can learn how to be a superintendent, how I can run Rat Life University. And I had a phone call the other day with an amazing woman, her name's Kathy just one of my angels in my life. Great mentor, who's, she is going to be responsible for me getting um, my next job. By her grace, by her help, by literally who you know, like she knows these board members, and so she can give me a letter of recommendation from these people, it's just, it's awesome. Um, 
I brought her up for a particular reason, but... Lu, lu, lu. Once I made up my mind about whom to listen to, my education about money began. And I put, when the student is ready, the, the teacher appears. And I love that so much. And I put, the world becomes your library. So the insight that I got was, you know, I'm gonna attend all the board meetings that I possibly can because I wanna be at the front row, dressed super sharp, right? Suit and tie, smiling to all these board members who have the ability to elevate me from my position in life. But my whole goal is to get that, the, to be what's called the executive assistant the superintendent board of education because then I could shadow the guru. I learned this from Ty Lopez that the number one way you can learn is what's called kinesthetic learning. It's work-based learning. It's like how you learn to become a nurse or become a doctor is you do your residency, you do your rounds. Like you're actually administering IV, you're actually drawing blood, you're actually doing the job. So the best way that I can learn to run Rat Life University as the best leader that I possibly can is by shadowing a superintendent. That's how you fast track the whole thing, right? Most people, they climb the Rat Life ladder. So they'll be like a teacher and they'll be an administrator and then they'll be a director, then they'll be a principal, then they'll be you know, an assistant superintendent and then they'll be a superintendent, right? They spend 30 years getting their doctorate, getting hundreds of thousand dollars in student loan debt to be this rat in, if you've ever played the game World of Warcraft, the, high, the, the peak of PVE, player versus environment, right? Not stepping into the arena. You're playing with monopoly money. Grant funds, they call it bonds, just, um, yeah, like I said, grants, government funding. It's, it's all, it's all, uh, it's a wahizi, it's a wahoozy, it's fairy dust, it's not real. <laughs> It's gonna get copyright from uh, <laughs> plagiarizing Wolf of Wall Street. Um, but shadowing the guru, work-based learning, kinesthetic learning, that's the best way you can learn. That's the greatest retention when it comes to learning, shadowing the expert in the field. But that was the insight that I got was, um, there's a school district in Laguna Beach that I've been, it's been a dream of mine to work at. And so the insight that I got on my hero's journey was to go to their board meetings, just to, or just to look at when their board meetings are. And sure enough, it was one was scheduled for that day. And so I went, and then I got the insight that I believe their executive assistant to their superintendent is going to be retiring this year. And so the six-figure job that I've been trying for for the past year and a half, failure after failure after failure, there's a good quote um, that I came across on the bottom of my fries, right, from In-N-Out. And they have a, a quote from the Bible, a parable. And mine said Proverbs 24, 16. And I looked that up and it said, for a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. And I counted how many failed interviews they had for how many different jobs that I've tried to get a promotion for in the past year and a half, trying to level up within the rat life. And it was just before the day I was scheduled to interview for my seventh one. And so I believe this is gonna be the six figure job that I've been working so hard to get for the past year and a half. And now I'm taking massive action to enact the quote, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. As in, I was given the gift of sight on my hero's journey that this is going to be a vacancy in the future. I truly believe it's going to, to be, um, based on what I saw that day. I saw another woman shadowing her, insinuating that why would a person be shadowing another person unless there's two options. Number one, she's retiring, which I believe that is the, the reason I was guided to there that day. The other is that, you know, she's learning to cover for her because this person knows they're going to be out um, for, you know, a board meeting in the future. But. I don't think it's the latter because somebody who's been in that position, her, uh, the one who I'm hoping to succeed for 25 years, I don't think she would schedule time off um, uh, around those days, given that that's her, you know, her sole role you know, in that position. So, does that make sense? Your insight, your intelligence, the creativity, the divine intelligence that's gifted to you, like Frodo, on your hero's journey, on your noble quest, right? And I'll tell you this, being under the weather is not fun. But we said we were gonna do this lecture today even though we look like Oompa Loompa, we're gonna do it. So this could be the worst one to date based on the production quality, but we're getting this done. And this is a gift to anyone who doesn't have a foundation of financial literacy. So that's why we're all doing it. But some, when, I, when I got that sight, when I had that vision, right, for my quest, it was actually really exciting. So even though I'm not where I want to be yet financially, even though I earn right now, my salary is like $77,000, which I consider beyond failure for my competency, my knowledge, my intellect, my capability, my potential. 
um, my work ethic, drive, ambition, you name it. Um, it's very, very exciting that you're now on this hero's quest. You know what I'm saying? And it's really cool because you get to cross this threshold of actually enjoying the process. Because if you're able to zoom out and expand the time horizon, it's like you know you're going to be a millionaire one day. You know you're going to be a billionaire one day. It's just like you're going to look back and reminisce about this little grind. Like what's this one, two, three year period where you know you were living in your car, where you were making less than six figures, or you know whatever the case. You know, or you had a bunch of debt. You know, didn't have your dream car, didn't have your dream, you know, apartment or significant other or your kids. You know, whatever. But that just makes for such a great story throughout the totality of your life. It's like as if it's a video game. There are people who just they haven't experienced these areas of the map that you got to experience in your life. And so, what a shame is it to go through your entire life not having lived, not having any stories to tell, because you chose to play it safe, because you chose to take no risk. Because you chose never to go for it, so all you have is regret. All you have is what if. You know, I—that's not the life that I want to live. I want to live the life where I fucking went for it, where I continue to try, continue to fail, continue to get up, to rise again, to try again. Right? Understanding that you're a finite number of tries away from your success. So we can move on from that. And then I ended the notes by saying, "You're only poor if you give up. Keep going, don't quit." A little hype to myself. And now, and this is a quote from Robert Kiyosaki in the book, and now I was a slave for 10 cents an hour. So he learned from a very young age to not work for money, which is a recurring theme in the book. Because that's how they get you to be a slave, dude. Learning retention, I drew a chart. I wrote it out, chart right here. And this is fascinating because this gives you guys insight to these lectures. You retain 10% of what you read, right? So that's the first step. So when we read these books in, in the university, you're retaining 10% of the material just by reading it. Okay, 20% listening, so lectures, audios, podcasts. 30% by seeing, so seeing pictures, seeing presentations, or seeing this video. 50% hear and see, right? So if you're present watching this video, you get to hear the gold, right? Hear the gold and you get to see the gold, okay? 70% by giving a talk, discussion right? What we say, that's what I'm doing, okay? So me making these, I get to retain 70% of what I'm reading, right? Of the, the new knowledge, the new material. 90% retention is by doing the real thing. What we talked about, shadowing the guru, right? Shadowing the master, okay? Work-based learning, you doing the fucking thing yourself, okay? Saying and doing, right? Doing what you say, doing what you preach, doing what you say. So that's why I love doing this university. I've talked about this before, but how many times of iteration do I get to retain the material? Because first I read it, okay? Then I make highlights in it. Then I extract and transcribe everything that I highlighted. It took me two hours to do that. Then I read everything that I wrote. Then I do this lecture, right? Then I, I speak and I discuss everything that I wrote, that I transcribed, that I read. Then I play this back when I edit, so I get to hear what I say, and I get to iterate, and then I get to, do you see how many levels there are to this for me, right? For you, all you get is the 50%. You get what you hear if you're actually listening, and what you see if you're actually here present watching. Where you can take it to the next level for you is the application of what I'm saying, which is in the homework assignments that I'm giving you. Okay. Which we said number one, and this has been a homework assignment before, remove I can't from your vocabulary. It ties in with your identity. When you say I can't do blank, your mind doesn't even go to work to try. I can't make this amount of money. I can't have this relationship. I can't get out of debt. I can't wake up this early. I can't go to the gym. I can't eat these foods for a bullshit story your excuses as to why you can't. Because you don't have the courage to say it's not a priority. Oh no, but my kids. Fuck your kids. Oh no, but my work. Oh no, but my, I'm a parent. I'm a grandparent. No, I, if it's the gym, dude, I've trained grandparents who found time to go to the gym. Oh no, you're sick. I've trained cancer clients who found time to go to the gym, who found the energy to go to the gym. Oh no, I can't. It's an excuse. The only thing stopping you from achieving your goal is the bullshit story you keep telling yourself as to why you can't. The 
fact of the matter is it's not a priority or else you would. It is that simple. This university is predicated on humility, honesty, ownership, responsibility, personal agency, accountability, right? It is your fault, your fault. The beauty about that is don't use the past as a baton to beat yourself to death with, to learn from, to grow from, to heal from, to improve from, got it? Give yourself the power to change by looking at yourself honestly and clear where you are right now. No problem, that was my fault. What's to come, that's my fault too, do you get it? We're not here to condemn, to judge, to criticize, to ostracize. We're here to learn, to grow, to heal, to improve, to better ourselves. We become better, everyone else on our team improves, right? Life's not about what you get, it's about who you become. Who you become, right, from improving. And what you're able to give, to others on your team and now that you've become more. The only reason I'm able to heal other people so well is because I've become so much more that I can offer that to others. You know, I've uh, refined and refined and refined my healing divinity, I would say, because we all have that. We all have the ability to heal other people through the power of our words, right? But it comes from wisdom of experience. It comes from the humility from failure, from rejection, from getting wrecked myself, right? It comes from courage to try and to fail and then to learn. And so now I have this new perspective, this new you know, education, knowledge, wisdom that I can now help others, right? Who are going through the same path or who are trying to overcome that same problem. You got it? So that's the learning curve. So I encourage you guys to to do more than just passively listen. You don't get anything from that. Do more than just passively watch this. You don't get anything from that. It's just it's just uh, motivational porn, right? It's what you apply. What action do you take after these videos, right? Are you an actual student on the path looking to improve, right? Or are you just like, yeah, nice video. Yeah, that sounds good. I'm not gonna fucking do anything about it, right? So I'm gonna be in the same place next year as I am today, right? How many more of those years do you have left? Like, how much time do you have left before the window of opportunity that you have to transform your life, to change your life forever, for you and everyone that you love, how long do you have before that window closes? Food for thought. Life pushes all of us around. Few learn the lesson, most quit. A few like you fight. The ones who fight the enslavement that they're in are the ones who take inventory that they are enslaved, right? But it takes you waking up first. It takes you doing the math on the rat life trap, right? How much are you paying for your car that you're financing? How much is actually going to principal, okay? And then do the math, because I want you to push the pain threshold. How much are you going to be paying in the totality of that car payment if you continue to pay the minimum payments? Oh, an extra $10,000. Do that same math on your credit card. Do that same math on your student loans. Do that same math on your mortgage, right? Then you'll be like, wow, if I don't do something, I'm gonna be a slave for the rest of my fucking life. Okay, do you get it? Because when they give you the sticker price of just this is how much you're paying, plus whatever percent interest, yeah, just sign right here, don't worry about that. They're not including any other bill that you have, right? The car, the student loan, the credit card, the mortgage, the PMI, the homeowner's insurance, the property tax, the utility bill, the phone bill, the gym membership, the Netflix subscription, your food, your gas, your health insurance, the interest accruing on all these things, and that's for one person times your family. Like, like is that resonating? That is what the rat life is. That's how they can keep you as a slave forever. That's how they do it. It's where you have to work for necessity from financial illiteracy. Because if you knew this, you wouldn't be in this position, right? There's a difference between you knowing something conceptually, right? And you actually applying that knowledge. Quote from Jim Rohn, new knowledge isn't necessarily learning something new. It's learning to behave in a way we haven't previously been behaving, okay? So have the humility to do that audit, even if you feel like, oh yeah, I know where my money goes. Bullshit. Because if you did, and if you were active in your your financial development and improvement, you would not be where you are right now. You would be in a better, greener pasture, right? 
That's all leveled the fuck up. And if you're on it, good for you. Kudos, okay? I'm happy for you, I'm stoked. Life isn't a zero-sum game. I know you winning isn't me losing, right? But I know most people neglect it, dude. They sweep it under the rug, just like they do with their body. How many people do you know who actually count their calories? Who put themselves into a caloric deficit? Who know what a refeed day is? How many people do you know who actually know their current outstanding debt to the dollar? Their current overhead expenses to the dollar? Yeah, zero. Okay. What you don't measure, you can't improve. Okay. Stop blaming me and thinking I'm the problem. This is his rich dad talking to him. If you think I'm the problem, this is, this is a very important ideology. If you think I'm the problem, then you have to change me. If you realize that you're the problem, then you can change yourself. Learn something and grow wiser. That's the game. So long as you put ownership, accountability, blame on other people, how convenient is it of an excuse? I can't do blank because of my boss, my spouse, my kids. Convenient, everybody but you. How convenient that you don't have any power to change because you've allocated that to somebody else. It's a bullshit convenient cop-out to avoid you of any responsibility or ownership. To take action. I was gonna say to take what? Class? To take action, okay? Put the blame on you. Understand you're the problem. Not your job, not your circumstances, not your condition, not your past, right? You, where you are now, your fault, okay? The sooner you do that, the sooner you give yourself power to change, to improve, to grow, to heal, to better yourself and your whole team, okay? The poor and middle class work for money. The rich have money work for them. Buying or building assets that deliver cash flow is putting money, putting your money to work for you, okay? So that's the whole thing that was really like a whoa kind of a moment, a mind blown, is when he articulated what a liability and what an asset are. And he says it very simply. An asset is something that puts money into my pocket. A liability is something that takes money out of my pocket. Most people say, oh, my house is a, is a asset, right? Because I have equity in my house that I can pull out or I can do a refinance or, okay. What are you, how much cash flow are you taking in on any daily basis from your single unit property that you have a 30 year fixed rate mortgage on? Oh, that's right, nothing, right? You're not renting out any of the other rooms. You're not converting it into an Airbnb. It's a single unit family home that you use for you and your family that you're paying your mortgage on, right? Your mortgage payment, that what is getting allocated to principal, what's getting allocated to interest. Okay, then you have your PMI because you didn't pay 20% of the equity. Okay, then now you have your homeowner's insurance. Now you have your property tax. Now you have your utility bill. Oh, that's an asset? No, no. that's a liability. It's bleeding you. You're not generating income from this asset. It's financially raping you. Do you understand? Okay. Food for thought. And so for future investors who, you know, people who got into their mortgage on an FHA loan, which is a loan that only requires you to put three and a half percent down, you can use that loan to leverage a duplex or a triplex or a quadplex. That's what I plan to do in the future, is to use that same three and a half percent, but rather than purchase a liability, which is a single family unit home, which the only person who benefits from that is who? Is the bank, right? That's why they sell you, that's why they, they, they market it as the American dream for you to own that home. 30, 50, 70 years ago, we'll say 70, when the, we'll say uh, 90, when the book The Richest Man in Babylon was published, which was 1934. So that's exactly 90 years ago, right? 70 plus, yeah, exactly 90 years ago. You could own a house outright in four years on a high school diploma, single family income, okay? That is not a thing today, no right? Idea. Not a thing. Because average salary went from $30,000 <laughs> to $50,000. And the average cost of a home went from under $100,000 to now in California, it's over $800,000. Do you see that variance? So the, idea, the, the thought of you having your home, your single family home today as an asset that you're gonna own outright tomorrow is very unrealistic today. So they sold you on a bullshit dream for you to be a slave in one place paying your taxes on that property like a good docile slave for 30 years. That's what they want. They want you as a good slave in the machine where you're forced to work for necessity until you die. Moving on. The fear of starting over. 
I thought that was a really good point to bring into this lecture because most people are afraid to do that. Like when I had to start from book one within this university, within this Noble Quest, um, that was from doing Rat Life, the pre-workout supplement company. I started that, I launched in February of 2021. No, no, February of 2020, right before the, pan, the scamdemic. And so, excuse me, I did that for three years, man. Th over three years to put that on the shelf and start over because I knew that the real problem wasn't in a supplement, wasn't in pre-workout. You know, the way that we can change the world is by giving them education, is by giving them books like this, like meditations, books like this, Rich Dad Poor Dad, books like this, which is gonna be the next one we read, psycho -Cybernetics. People who don't know that these books even exist outside of Western civilization, that kid in Siberia, that kid in Kazakhstan, that kid in Portugal, in Brazil, in Argentina, You've never heard of these books. They, they're, they will go their entire life, have never been given access to this kind of education that we from the embarking on this quest of this university can provide them one day. Because with AI, every single one of these lectures will be able to be translated in every language that exists. So it's, it's an education problem. It's an access problem, right? And so I knew that the solution to helping people escape the rat life, or I discovered, it wasn't in a pre-workout. Even though the gym for me has always been my home, it's always been my escape, right? It's always exemplified the quote, we're all gonna make it. The gym was always yes, in a world full of no's and rejection and just lies and manipulation and garbage, excuses, lack of support, you know, all of that trash, the gym was always yes, you know? I think it's Ronnie Coleman who says it, I don't know. 200 pounds in the gym is always 200 pounds, right? It's the fairest form of society. What you put in is what you get out can't buy it, can't steal it, can't. And the virtues that you exalt through physical training, you can't get anywhere else. Work ethic, perseverance, heart, discipline, how to be patient, how to be alone, how to overcome failure. You can't buy those, man. That's only from going through the fire, right? To where you have such a high degree of stress tolerance that when you go to your rat life, your problems are so easy. And you can see the people who are such worse leaders because they have no idea what perseverance is, what will is, willpower, what giving it your all means. So while I love the gym, while the gym is so close to, to my heart, and it's the only reason I'm here today, I knew it wasn't the solution. I knew that, or I discovered that education is the problem, right? People don't know the rat life trap that they're in. You know, people don't know how to escape from their rat life trap because they're financially illiterate, right? People don't know these books in this university even exist that literally teach you. The only, th the only reason I know what I know from financial literacy is because I've read you know, Money Master the Game by Tony Robbins. I've read Unshakable. I've read Think and Grow Rich. I've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You know, I've, read, I've read all of these books where they break it down. Hey, what's a certificate of deposit? What's a Roth IRA? What's compound interest? You know, what's an asset? What's a liability? Like the, the basics that they don't teach you because they don't want you to be free, right? They don't want you to level up. They don't want you to escape. They want you to be a slave forever, right? That's the game. Because if you're free, then who do they have to, to run the system, right? They need slaves. They need slaves, good, docile, obedient, numb, distracted, depressed people paying their taxes because they can control you the easiest, right? So, I don't know, man, that, that's where I juxtapose it from. It's just like, or compare and contrast. What's the alternative, dude? It's slavery or freedom. Why are we doing this? Why am I here? Why am I making these videos, right? It's not for me, you know? I know where I'm going. I know what I want to do. But there's, the quote, life is about planting trees under whose shade will never sit, dude. One day, somebody's gonna watch this video. Somebody's gonna be like, wow, I, I never knew that, right? And it's gonna change their life. And not theirs, it's gonna change their whole circle, right? It's gonna be planting trees under your shade will never sit around the world, right? And not only from how that person grows and develops, but the first quote that I said earlier, life is not about what they get, it's about who they become and what they are able to give now that they've become more, you know? So, that's, the gift I get to reap 
from having the courage to start over, right? Start an entire university from book one, from law one, when the videos are getting no views, when we're not partnered on YouTube, when these aren't monetizing, right? Doing that for years in the absence of status, right? In the absence of um, recognition, admiration, adoration, approval, you know, um, for, or support from any of my peers. No one gives a fuck about these videos right now, right? Nobody cares, right? And then one day, six years of consistency from now, then everyone's gonna pretend like they believed in you from the beginning. Do you know what I'm saying? So just have the courage to start over when you know where your path leads you, is wanting to lead you, right? That's your hero's story, dude. That's your nature's design. That's your greatest adventure is on the other side of that heroic and noble pursuit, right? And then the beauty about it is whatever happens is gonna be a good story to tell. At least it's the story where you went for it. Because the alternative is you don't do what you know you've been called to do. And you have to look back with the pain and agony and the wonder what if, right? What you could have became, could have gotten, what you could have done, the lives you could have changed had you had the courage to pursue. Okay. This is a good quote from the book. That's very true. A good cognizance of the rat life. You're taxed when you earn, when you spend, when you save, when you die. I don't want to hammer that one. You know how much you're paying in taxes. Oh, slavery. Next. They work very hard for little money, clinging to the, the illusion of job security. Yeah, for a job that will replace you in two weeks if you, if you die tomorrow. That's the job you're killing yourself over. And looking forward to a three week vacation each year and maybe a skimpy pension after 45 years of service. That's exactly what I say, dude. When I look at people, there was somebody who worked for the company that I work for right now, the school district, and in service for 43 years. And I, I said to a coworker like a month, a month ago, I said, who even talks about this person today? You know, very rarely, but otherwise nobody gives a shit. And that's 43 years of life. The, the, the idea of a legacy, it's such a, such a delusion, such an illusion. So I, I always encourage people that to focus on yourself, to take care of yourself, to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. That, that quote I love that I got from Jim Rohn, because the job that you're killing yourself over, that you're aging yourself from, that you're causing yourself to be so stressed, that you're manufacturing so much cortisol and adrenaline, stress and worry and concern, from these motherfuckers who, who they don't give a shit about you, who will replace you in a week if you, if you showed up dead, if you dropped dead tomorrow, right? Focus on your self. Okay. The fact that people don't do that blows my mind. Next. The lighting in this video has been atrocious. I apologize for my own standard. No, but e pay for better lighting or just say it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. Right. Most people never see the trap they're in. The pattern of get up, go to work, pay bills, get up, go to work, pay bills. Work, consume, die. Offer them more money and they continue the cycle by increasing their spending. That is what I call the rat race, AKA the rat life. My vision widened that day and I began to see the trap that lay ahead for most people. The day I was given the sight of the rat life is when I worked at my first school district and I did the math on my overhead expenses and it exceeded my income. As in my overhead was 3,500, my income was 3,300. I had to work as a personal trainer, make these side hustles, right? In order to make ends meet. And I said, wait a second, if I continue down this path, I'm a slave forever. And I looked at my coworker who aged horrifically. She was in her, she might've been 40. She looked like she was 60. She looked terrible. And I said, Tarek, if you don't do something, that's you in, she wasn't 60 in 20 years, right? And I said, there's no world in my one life where I'm going to be a slave like her, right? Who, for whatever rhyme or reason that they continue their job, that they continue making this amount of income, it's from fear and it's from cowardice. And I said that that will never be synonymous with my name. So I'm excited to see what day you realize the trap that you're in, the trap that laid before you, the rat race, the rat life that you're running that you are living right now. Next. 
The main cause of poverty or financial struggle, struggle is fear and ignorance. What I just said. Not the economy or the government or the rich. It's self-inflicted fear and ignorance that keep people trapped. It's very true. Most people are just financially illiterate. Why? Because it's not taught in school. Why? Because they don't want you financially literate. Why? Because then you would be free. They wouldn't be able to control you. They wouldn't be able to continue to have you on the farm, on the slave farm, because you would be awake, right? They don't want you awake. They want you asleep. They want you docile, numb, too afraid to try. To where taking out a $5,000 loan for a business, risky, taking out a $100,000 loan for a piece of paper that they call a degree, great choice. Or taking out an $800,000 loan for the American dream, single family unit home, great choice. That's the game, that's the game dog. It's time to wake up. It's just like the picture of a donkey dragging a cart with its owner dangling a carrot just in front of his nose. The donkey's owner may be going where he wants to go, but the donkey is chasing an illusion. Tomorrow there will only be another carrot for the donkey. How true is that? How true is that? And the carrot that they have you chasing is your promotion, which I actually talk about in this, I break down the math, is the salary increase and, and also a promotion. If the donkey could see the whole picture, it might rethink its choice of chasing the carrot. I love it. I feel like I'm reading you guys a, a bedtime story by it, because what I'm doing, I've, I've shared this with you before, I'm extracting all of the gold from these books and I'm giving it to you, right? Because I want to share all of this gold with all my my good friends, my good my good patronages, my, my good patrons, my good my good team. Everyone who is embarking on this noble quest with me, who is willing to even listen to this, let alone watch this, let alone comment and share and, and subscribe and be a part of the team, be a student on this noble quest, transform their life entirely. No, we can dream. Soon there will be such a horrifying gap between the rich and the poor that chaos will break out and another great civilization will collapse. History proves that great civilizations collapse when the gap between the haves and the have-nots is too great. It's very true. So if you consider that, you can also consider that we're looking at the, the downfall of the, the United States as a, as a superpower, as an empire in real time, which is unfortunate because in whoever's watching this, in your lifetime, this has been the, the dominant world power for your entire life. You and I have never lived through the demise of, you know, for example, the Macedonian Empire under Alexander, the Roman Empire after Caesar, the British Empire. You've never seen that collapse, but you know what they look like today versus the vast lands that they spanned in their peak, right? It's a shame to see what the United States is going to become, but hopefully we can delay the demise from a certain election that's going to happen in a couple weeks' time. Sips tea. <laughs> My throat is so hoarse from talking, but we're going to get through this. Learn to use your emotions to think, not think with your emotions. It's a good quote from, I believe it's from every book that we've read, but Marcus Aurelius talks about this in Meditations. Emotional stoicism, mastering your emotions, responding and not reacting, having emotional control. In the rat life that I work, that is, is um, omitted from all of my leaders, right? Versus um, emotional non-control is omnipresent, as in projection, as in an in capability to tolerate stress. Very unfortunate. And those are your leaders. That's okay. This too shall pass. One day I'll be running the school district myself and I have the gift now of perspective from the position that I'm in and that's gonna make me the best kind of leader. It's what Marcus Aurelius talks about in meditation that the best emperor is a philosopher and the worst political leaders are ones who went through the you know the normal political process and that's exactly the rats that embody the educational system within the rat life today they're the worst kind of leaders because they're the furthest thing from a philosopher as in they don't have 
the philosophies that I'm inviting and insinuating and encouraging within this university. Things like delayed gratification or emotional stoicism or discipline, work ethic, perseverance, heart, character, integrity. They don't have, they don't share those ideologies, you know, those, in, those, uh, <laughs> those values. Um, but that's okay because one day it'll be me. So I'm just going to tie that and we'll do another one. My bags and my eyes are getting, <laughs> it's becoming luggage. <laughs> but we will get through this, my friends. We will get through this together. Here we go. Uh, the problem was that creating money is legal for the government and banks to do, but illegal for us to do. It's fascinating, what they call quantitative, quantitative easing. Quantitative easing. The Federal Reserve can, put, can print and put money into supply. They call it quantitative easing. That's weird, and my English isn't the best. But when I put a $100 bill into a copy machine and I print out my money, that's called counterfeiting and I go to jail. Weird when the bank does it, it's no problem, no questions asked, but when I do it, it's illegal and you slave peasant rat, go, you forget where you belong. You don't get to do this, we get to do this. You go to jail, okay. Fascinating, but illegal for us to do. There are legal ways to create money from nothing, he told us. Food for thought from Rich Dad. The illusion of money is held together by billions of people who believe that money is real. And this is a very important lesson within the book, is understanding that money is not real. For one, for the lesson that I just shared, another one I'll give you is fractional reserve banking, which I went over before, but when you deposit $100 into the bank, by fractional reserve banking, your bank is only legally required to hold 0 to 10% of your deposit. What does that mean? They're legally allowed to lend out 90 to 100% of the money that you deposit in. As in, I put $100 in the bank, 90 of those dollars aren't even there. What does that mean? The number that I see reflected on my bank statement, my bank balance, my checking account, it's not real. It's not even physically there in the bank. Do you understand? And what are they doing with your, with your money that's already been taxed? <laughs> They're lending it out. They're making money off of your, your slave money. It's not real. The sooner you understand money is not real, the sooner you'll detach emotionally from money. The sooner you'll stop killing yourself over your slave job because you think the money that you're making is real. It's not. And then when you understand that, you'll get infuriated about the amount of money that you make. You'll, you'll be like, how can I justify this? I'm getting the breadcrumbs of the breadcrumbs of the breadcrumbs, right? And I'm also killing myself over these breadcrumbs in a job that would replace me in, in a week if I dropped dead tomorrow. The knowledge, awareness, cognizance of all that should infuriate you. And you should be like, dude, I need to get the hell out of this enslavement, right? Then you start playing the rat life to win and to be free forever when you understand the game. The sooner you understand that, the better. Money is really made up. It's only because of the illusion, the house of cards, right? Of confidence and the ignorance of the masses that this house of cards stands. I said it earlier. It is very true. If everyone collectively agreed on the truth that this is all garbage and all made up, then the world would burn in a heartbeat. Banks would, dude. It's that quote from the movie. I think it's a bug's life. It's, there's so many of them and there's so few of us. And I actually had my horrific leadership say that the other day in one of our leadership meetings. She was talking about how it was a room of like 10 of our administrators and managers. And we have like over a hundred teachers. And that was, one, it was so sick that she said that. She's such a shitty leader. She said, there's, they outnumber us like 10 to one. And if they knew that, and she had this like laugh afterwards. That's garbage leadership that's omnipresent in the workplace today. And you can extrapolate that outside of education. Like that's every horrific leader, or I'm sorry, horrific, rat that calls himself a leader because they have a made-up title in a position of authority over others. It's disgusting, but that's the reality of it. And if you knew the amount of power that you had in numbers, people would fight back, right? Ask yourself better questions now. Why do you think they're doing all this DEI bullshit, all this diversity, equity, and inclusion? They want everyone to not have any brotherhood, you know? Because what happens when you have brotherhood, right? 
that's when revolutions happen. That's when people band together to fight tyranny. They don't want that, dude. They want all of us separated. They want all of us fighting amongst each other. They don't want any of us having a brotherhood by creed, a brotherhood by race. They don't want that. And they'll manipulate it in the sense that if you want that, you're the intolerant one. You're the racist. No, no, no. I vibe, not vibe, vie. I vie and I stand behind freedom. And I understand that the only way tyranny stands is that good men stand idle. And good men don't, good men don't have the courage to speak the truth in the absence of numbers because most men are cowards in the world that we live in today. So ask yourself those questions. Why are they pushing DEI so much? Why are they pushing the gays and the LBGT, LMNOP so much? Why is that in your classroom? That's right, because they can't get to you, but they can get to your kids. Ask yourself these questions. I want everyone to wake up in this university because if you don't, if you stay lulled and if you stay asleep, right? No problem. Then let's have you work for necessity. Let's have the cost of living so high that your spouse has to work for necessity. That's no problem. Now who's programming your kids? That's right, the school. Okay, now let's put these, what they call curriculum in the school. Hey, what's that flag in my classroom? Hey dad, what's my gender today? Am I binary? What's a lesbian? A five-year-old. That's the education system today. That's the importance of you waking up. And that's, I know that's a huge tangent, but it's not. When I say money is not real, it's you beginning to be perspicacious. You beginning to be aware. You beginning to look around, open your eyes, to be awake, right? From the rat life that you're in. That was the biggest epiphany to you when I first read this book in 2021, August in Croatia. I was just like, wow, this is the system. This is the game. This is how hard I'm getting. Get it? It's a house of cards, dude. It's not real. It is fairy dust. It's an illusion to keep you distracted, to keep you reliant on the system, the very system that's enslaving you, to keep you as a good, docile, distracted slave. Hammer that out. By not getting paid for our work at the store, we were forced to use our imaginations to identify an opportunity to make money. And I put in all caps, I said, use your mind to think. It's actually the beauty of entrepreneurship is it forces you, and I put this later on, it forces you to become resourceful. It forces you to use your mind. And that's the biggest disservice and shame and disgrace is people who go through their entire life never escaping the rat life, never pursuing entrepreneurship, starting your own business, and you go through your entire life with the safety and the safety net and the security of a paycheck, you forfeit the beauty that is discovering how resourceful you become when necessity demands it. It's actually the biggest shame in life that you'll never understand how resourceful and smart and creative you are because you never put yourself consciously through the fire where you have that urgency. And there are ways that you can, you know, uh, artificially manufacture that. You can have a child, you can have somebody get sick. And so now, you'll, you, those are perfect examples of how anyone who's experienced those events, you see how you level up. You see how necessity demands urgency, demands action. Right? So you'll find a way. What was once I can't, no, no, wasn't a priority. Now that it is a priority because you have to feed this kid, you have to heal this sick family member. Oh, that's weird. Now you found a way. So the only thing that was standing in the way of you achieving your goal was the bullshit story you kept telling yourself as to why you can't. Fascinating. Our assets are lar large enough. It's all food for thought, food for consideration. I'm just trying to you know, hammer the idea, wake up, wake up, wake up. Our assets are large enough to grow by themselves. It's like planting a tree. You water it for years and then one day, dot, 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 which is the breakthrough. Success cycle, belief, potential, action results over time until, until, until you're free forever, until your passive income from stocks, from real estate, not single family home, unit home, no. but from multi-unit properties, that you're you know, having other tenants in that are paying your mortgage and your overhead expenses and then over time they're paying more than that so you're actually getting cash flow and then it becomes an actual asset. Once your passive income from all of your you know, assets that you've been acquiring over time produce more 
money, then the cost of your overhead expenses, that's when you're free. That's when you're free forever. That's when you're free to no longer work for necessity. You can work for, for joy, for choice. That's the game. That's the until. That's the breakthrough. That's when you're free forever. Until then, you have to work for active income, which is fine. It's part of the journey. It's part of the hero's quest. Too many people are too focused on money and not on their greatest wealth, their education. Amen. If people are prepared to be flexible, keep an open mind, and learn, they will grow richer and richer despite tough changes. It's very true. Most people fail to realize that in life, excuse me, it's not how much you make, it's how much money you keep. Okay, so two things right there. The education is the problem, okay? And so what I wanted to do in this lovely university is be completely transparent of my financial position with my, with debt, with income, with everything right now. I broke it down, okay? Income, debt, expenses, right? So right now, I have three credit cards with low balances. One has a 900 limit, one has a 2000 limit, one has a, a 2000 limit. One has a 1750 balance, one has a uh, $1,400 balance, one is paid off. And then I have what's called a uniform loan, which is it's like $450, but it's something that the school credit union offers where there's no interest on it. So it's just a you pay, it's like $50 per month and then it's paid off in full. I owe my brother $2,000 for the remaining debt on Rat Life, which I've already paid him back full principal. This two grand is the interest that accrued on this credit card from you know, everything that we charged on that for all the inventory, of all the product for the business. And then I promised him 10% interest on taking on the venture. So I'm gonna pay him in full. And then I have unused, um, un unused paid training sessions from past client. And then I want to pay my mom a few hundred dollars for <laughs> my phone that I lost at EDC. And then I think it was my little sister who paid for it. Um, but that one I'm not concerned about paying back because what I did was rather than pay that, I assumed my mom's um, insurance payment because I'm trying to get in the habit of um, slowly retiring her by taking her expenses off from her one by one. And then my car note, my UCLA note. And then I promised somebody that I would take them to Switzerland if their significant other didn't take them to Switzerland. So all of those are all of my words kept, right? That's all of my outstanding debt. Anything that I've made a promise to or any actual monetary debt that I have, period. Overhead expenses. So I pay for my rent, car, mine and my mom's insurance, food, haircut, gym, gas, laundry, um, the electricity here, and then whatever, you know, credit card balances. Um, and so in total, my overhead is like $4,157. And my, my income, and this is the important part because it's not about what you make, it's about what you keep. So on paper, I make $6,420 per month, which is a salary of $77,040, but you only take home $4,936. So the margin there is $779 per month. Does that make sense? I know I went fast. So my overhead is 4,157. Oh, yeah. My income is 4,936 working the rat life at this level. So I have $779 per month that I can allocate towards debt, right? I, from the gift of vision of sight that I was given oh, yeah. October 10th, I believe that I'll be given that job in Laguna Beach, California. In I believe the position is gonna go live end of March and the application is gonna close in April. I believe that um, I'm gonna test, I'm gonna be invited to test for it end of April. And I believe interview one and interview two will be May. And then I believe at the end of May, I'll negotiate starting step four because they have seven steps. What that means is you can, you're supposed to start at step one, but I'm gonna negotiate past experience and um, uh, merit in order to you know, play the rat life game to win to where you don't start at step one and waste a year, 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 year to start here when you can just start here and then begin. Because I understand that none of it's real, it's all made up. And when you're negotiating your salary, you understand that you're not combating the, the most hardcore elite sales representative. You're talking with HR. <laughs> it's a lot easier to just say yes than it is to go through the hiring process all over again of another candidate. And so I'm expecting to earn in Okay, so we are in October, so November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June. So in eight months, because I'm planning to start in July, $136,239. So I've also done the math on that. So the math on that sounds like a big number, but then what do you actually keep? I took the same, uh, a little less percentage than what's taken out right, right now in terms of what I keep. 
I don't want to confuse you. I took a higher percentage out from what I'm anticipating because I'm going to be earning more what's going to be taken out for taxes and withheld to my CalPERS, which is my 401k, um, to what I anticipate will be about $8,628.47, which is my take home. And so what I would actually pocket would be um, after my overhead expenses, which won't increase, which I actually got a letter today, it's actually sitting on my uh, table, that um, there's a you know required rate of California of how much renters can increase your rent by. And so my rent is gonna go from, right now it's 2460, that includes the sewer water trash, and there's like a $10, $10 it's like a 9.95 uh, charge fee that they charge you. That 2460 is gonna go to, um, it's gonna to go to 2460, not including the water, sewage, trash, and things. So I anticipate my rent is gonna be like 2,500 on the dot. So other than that increase and the gas that's gonna cost me to commute to Laguna Beach back and forth, but I have a very uh, um, gas friendly, is it, <laughs> is it a gas friendly car? Uh, I get great mileage on my car. Um, I'll be able to save $4,500. Um, which I believe at that stage of my life, I'll be in a stage to be a complete provider for another person. Um, so let's say you're paying for another person's food, gym membership, say feminine care, clothing. Um, I anticipate that my non-negotiable is going to be me pocketing $4,000 per month. Because that's why when you do the math like that, something like a $13,600 um, $13, car note, um, I'll be able to pay off in three, in three months instantly versus six years. So that's why I'm not concerned about my outstanding debt right now because I've expanded my time horizon. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I wholeheartedly believe that, you know, uh, what did we say, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June? I believe that eight months from now I'll be earning $136,239. So I, I, I don't believe that where I am right now. This too shall pass. It's just temporary, man. The clowns that I work yeah, with, yeah. my bank balance, my outstanding debt, this is all this is all very, very temporary. And the beauty about that is that your progression on your hero's journey, right, on your, your own noble quest, it won't be linear. You'll find it'll be exponential. And the sooner that you start, the sooner that you make progress, and a book that's not gonna be in this university, but one where I learned, um, it's beautiful, and I'll, I touch, touch upon it in my, in my notes, but I can fast track it, is, I'm not gonna fast track this lecture, but this idea, this insight, called The Baby Steps by Dave Ramsey. And it ties in beautifully with the book that we read, which was The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. And the difference between rational and reason, reasonable. It's rational to say, oh, I'm gonna pay off high interest debt first, right? But it's not, uh, pay, being rational when it comes to your finances is you're not gonna find success in it because it wasn't logic and rationale that got you into the place that you're at right now. So he has this idea called The Baby Steps and one of them is, you, first you secure a thousand dollar savings, right? An emergency fund. And then you attack your, you list out all of your debts, which I've done. And you put them in in order of the smallest amount to the largest amount. And he'll get, you know, so much objection and criticism that, no, no, I'm gonna pay my high interest debt first. It's like, shut the hell up, pay off your smallest balance first. And what will that do? It'll allow you to tap into the success cycle. You'll gain momentum and it'll inspire you, it'll encourage you to, to attack the next one. And you'll be so happy, you'll feel so empowered, so in control, so finally in control of your financial destiny and freedom, right? Your financial independence. That now, this will become more of a priority. You'll be more encouraged to not spend money on Uber Eats, not spend money on eating out, on restaurants, on bars, on alcohol, and all this garbage, right? On all these distractions from your freedom. And so that's the premise of it. It's not rational to pay off a lower interest rate, you know, debt first, right? That would give you a higher return immediately. But it's reasonable because now we're gonna cross these off one by one by one by one. Here's the challenge of it, okay? When I did the math, okay, this is gonna take a lot of humility, right? A $13,600 car note, which by then will be 12 grand by, by June, July, a 30, it's like just, just over $39,000 uh, UCLA student loan balance for my student loans. And I did the math on it, okay? By the time, with this $136,239 salary, okay, that I'm expecting now to make, that I'm 
call it manifesting, that I'm, I'm embodying that person now. Good quote by Greg Plitt. You have to believe in yourself enough to be the person now that others will remember you for later. And I know that I'm already in that position now and I'm acting as if now. And that's how I know that that future is going to be inevitable. I'm going to inevitably become that because I'm embodying it every single day. In terms of my visualization, in terms of my rehearsal, I have it written down. I read it every day. I say it every day. I say, I am. You know, we talk about confirmation bias. We talk about your mind going to work even while you're asleep to confirm your identity. We learned this in the book, um, Eat That Frog by Brian Tracy. To harness the power of your mind, you, you shift your goals to putting it in the present tense. I am this. I earn this today. Because your mind will say, no, that, that's not true. But this is what you're saying your identity is, right? So your mind will work. It'll conspire with the faiths and with the universe, with God, with nature. Joe Dispenza talks about you become a creator of your life. It literally, your mind will work to create the conditions and circumstances to give you the insights and guide you to the opportunities to create this reality. Do you see that? That's when you step into your divinity. That's when you step into the power of a creator. That's when you're, ha you're happening to life, right? I am the executive assistant to the superintendent and board of education of Laguna Beach Unified School District. I earn $136,239, right? And it will, you just say that over and over and over and you're taking all the action that you can until, okay? So that's gonna be the math to come is I anticipate I'll be able to save four grand per month. And then that stack will allow me to pay off those student loans in full, that car payment in full. But the reason that I share with you all of that is when we do the honest audit and, and I did the math, I don't get to zero until June of 2026 right? 20 months from today. That is a very, very hard pill for a lot of people to swallow is when they actually do the math on the hole that they're in and see how long it's going to actually take for them to be free. Most people, they're too afraid to look at them, their situation honestly in the mirror. And as much as that sucks, as much as it, by then it'll have taken me 10 years since I graduated from UCLA, to get to zero, that ensures a life of freedom forever. But most people who just ignore it, who don't bite the bullet, who don't, you know, face the music, face the noise, whatever that quote is, they will sweep it under the rug and they'll continue to be that slave dude, for a lifetime. I'm sharing this with you with honesty and with it, it, it gives me the gift of accountability. And the cool part is eight, from, eight months from now, I get to look back and see like, see, I, this is exactly what we said was gonna happen. And you can see right now, I'm on the frequency to earn that much because it, I don't have it on a pedestal anymore. Of, oh my gosh, when I earn six figures, it's like I already feel like I'm somebody who earns six figures by the way that I show up, by the leader that I am. Like that, physical reality, dude, is inevitable, right? Those, that circumstance, the, the idea that being poor is a mindset that I don't have, right? It's, it's five figures today, it's six figures eight months from now, it's seven figures a few years from now, it's eight figures a few years from now. It's just like, it, that idea that you're on your hero's journey, your hero's quest, all of this that you're going through right now, you're gonna look back and reminisce on these days. It's just like, dude, let's enjoy the process of becoming. And so I just wanted to, to offer you guys that I'll be debt free by June of 2026, 10 years exactly from entering the rat life. But the beauty about that is, and he actually says it rich dad, poor dad, to go broke while you're in your 20s because you still have time to recover. Most people, they never, they never go broke in their 20s. And so by the time they're in their 30s with a family, with, with a wife, with kids, that they don't have the courage to, they're too afraid to because now, they're so now reliant on their paycheck, on their slave wage, on their job, that they don't have the courage to pursue because now they have a kid to, to feed, they have a wife to provide for, they have a mortgage, the PMI, the homeowner's insurance, the property tax, all of those bills, the interest accruing on all of them. And so they get to live a life of perpetual slavery from cowardice of 
the inability of pursuit, inability right? Of pursuit. The omission of pursuit. And so they get to live their life um, in quiet desperation, <sighs> out of fear, out of cowardice, with the greatest pain, which is the burden of regret of what if. And in my yeah. one life, I am excited that because I had the courage to pursue, because I had the courage to live in my car for 93 days, because I had the courage to go broke, to go for it, to play a hand, to try, to fail, to learn, um, I will be free forever. Me and every single person who's been on my team offering support, encouragement, belief, love, um, they'll all be free, right? And because I had the courage to pursue, I'll be able to plant trees, millions of them around the world under whose shade I'll never sit, right? So. When you view it with that lens, you realize it's not your ability to have the courage to pursue it, it's your responsibility to have that courage, to have that heroism. And who is the casualty from your cowardice? You know, I would offer the consideration, who suffers from your neglect, from your fear? Food for thought. So I put 10 years to be 100% free from the rat life, the trap, of worldwide mass slavery. And that's for somebody who's hungry and on the grind to be free. How long are the people enslaved for who never do the math? A lifetime. Imagine the ones who were sold on getting a mortgage, a doctorate, um, a master's degree. They're a slave, and I put the vast majority, for life. Just from financial illiteracy, man. The greatest gift I ever got was I went to office hours for my archaeology professor because I was considering um, getting a master's degree in classics to study of ancient Greece, ancient Rome. She pulled out her degree and she said, this is a very expensive piece of paper. She said, unless this is your diehard passion of teaching or going into research or publication, she said, don't do it. Because she's in her 60s, she said, I'm still working to pay off this debt to this day. That candor was the, one of the greatest gifts I've ever been given in my life. And because of her, I didn't pursue further education within that field. And then I also did the math. I looked up on a job posting of what a UCLA professor with a doctorate degree earns, starting wage. And this was back in you know 2016. It was $59,000 with a doctorate, something that would have required them to be over $100,000 in student loan debt. In what world, after their overhead expenses, would they have that margin to pay that off ever? Answer, they wouldn't. Answer, they'd be a slave. Mean, or meaning, they'd be a slave forever, right? So, just do the math, man. So you get the status, oh man, I'm a doctor. Yeah, how much do you have in student loans? $100,000, $200,000? And you have, oh, I have this car, I have this. Yeah, that you finance? You're a slave, right? People, they're more interested of having this t made up title to impress these fuckers that don't give a shit about you, right? To buy things you don't even want with money you don't even have to impress people you don't even like. And that's the game for so many people. It's that keeping up with the Joneses mentality. Just most people, they live their life to be happy for the internet and not to be happy and free for themselves. Food for thought. If you want to be rich, you need to be financially literate. Rich people acquire assets, the poor and middle class acquire liabilities that they think are assets, such as the car, such as the house, the single unit home, family home. <clears throat> and this is him talking as a kid to his rich dad. You mean all we need to know is what an asset is, acquire them and we'll be rich? I asked. Rich dad nodded his head. It's that simple. It's funny, when you read The Alchemist, all of the vast wealth and knowledge of ancient, timeless wisdom was written on a single emerald. And I think it was Santiago that said that this can't be. And The Alchemist said that truth and wisdom often is that simple. But the arrogance that we have, that no, no, there's no way it could be that easy, it could be that simple, um, leads people to choose the life of slavery you know, forever, and to choose continuing down the path of ignorance, right? And I would experience that with helping people with finances, I would experience that with helping people with their physique. It's like, there's no way that doing this can elicit, you know, these results. It's, so let me continue doing what I've been doing that have gotten me the results that I've gotten forever. You know, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. 
It's from arrogance, and it's from ignorance, and it's from stupidity, and it's from a lack of humility. But that's the game. That's what most people are, is exceedingly arrogant. And that's why I love in the book Meditations, all you can do is endure them. You can only endure the people that you can't instruct. Because if your hand is like this, you're not in a position to receive the ancient wisdom. These bags are getting ridiculous under my eyes, man, but we're going to finish. Um, an asset puts money in my pocket. A liability takes money out of my pocket. Fascinating. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and read. Unlearn your lifetime programming, your lifetime conditioning. Dude. Well, the lifetime financial uh, illiteracy in the form of what you think is your financial literacy. And I put homework, do the math, right? Do the math. What is your paycheck, right? What is your salary? What are you, what's your take home, right? Who gives a shit about your gross? What's your net, okay? And then I said, this, the homework assignment is do the math on what your salary increase would be because I want you to see the, the illusion. And I did this for you, so I did the homework, okay? Before July, so before I hit my one-year mark at my current rat life job, I was earning $6,119 on paper. That equated to $4,711 in reality. Now I earn $6,420 on paper. That equates to $4,936 in reality. So on in reality, my increase was 4.6%, okay? Which was an extra $225 per month, okay? Inflation, at the time of July was 3.4 percent. Okay, meaning 166 dollars gets forfeited from adjusting for inflation. You understand? Because with inflation, my cost of goods is now here. So just because I I earn on paper 225 more, 166 I don't see because inflation's at 3.4 percent. That that makes sense. So what does that mean? After adjusting for inflation. My increase from a year of work accounts for $58.70 per month. What does that mean? It means to save $10,000, it would take me 14 years or 28 years to pay down the $10,000 to debt. Because when we did the math on it, 175 for my car payment was getting put to principal from a $304 payment. So I put each year I would save $704. $704 a year with this increase. And you don't have to do any more years because understand that even at this new rate of increase, which would probably be the same, about 4.6%, if you keep adjusting for inflation, which 3.4%, and that'll fluctuate from the twos, threes, some years it's very, very high, you realize <laughs> the slavery that you're in for a lifetime. Look at that. $704 I'd be able to save from that difference, from that margin in a year, right? A year of work yields $704, okay, from a year of slave work, okay. Meaning, to, to save $10,000, it'd take me 14 years to pay down that car payment, right, to pay down $10,000 to that car payment, which it's not putting $10,000 into it as we did the math on. It's putting twice as much into that because of what's actually going to principal and what's actually going to interest. That would take 28 years. Do you understand the math? Okay. That's your homework assignment and this battery's gonna die. So the homework assignment was do the math on your carrot. I titled it that, do the math on your carrot. Do the math on the carrot, which is your salary increase each year. Because whatever job you work, you know they have it posted your, what your expected salary increase is gonna be. They have your salary schedule. So you can do the math on it. Do the math on what, you, and what your take home actually is. And so the way that you can do that math is very simple. Because you can do the math on what your current take home is now, and it's just a division. So if I was intaking $619, but my take home at the time was 4,711, all you do is divide 4,711 by 6,119, and that's the percent yield that you can expect to take home the next year. So you just multiply the next year's salary by that percentage. And for me, it's 0 0.76. So if I do 4711 divided by 6,119, that gets me about 0 0.76. So you take 0.76 times what next year's salary is gonna be, which is 6,420. And that's a very, very good ballpark 
what you're expected to take home before you know you've received that paycheck that confirms what your take home is and so my current take home now is in, or you could just wait the year to see the difference is 4,936 okay so then you can do the math on those two balances to see what percentage that is which is 4.6 percent so if I do 4,711 divided by 4,936 you'll find that it's 95.4 percent so you just subtract that by one and then that's how you get the increase right that makes sense with me so far and so then you can do the actual math which is just which is just subtraction 4936 minus 4711 equals 225 okay then you can google what is the inflation rate okay in july when this change happened 3.4 percent okay 166 dollars i knew was going to inflation um oh that's what i did yeah, yeah. ignore everything that i just said you, it's 0 0.034 times the new balance of 4,936. That, that has to make sense because it's 3.4% of that money. Okay, we brought a full circle. And so now, from the subscrip subscription, from the subtraction that we did, I know these are a lot of numbers I'm throwing at you, but it's, it's just good to get you to start to think about it. From what you're making now to what you, you know, made a year ago, or if you're currently working this rat life job, what you're projecting to earn a year later, that difference, and then you subtract those two, that's how you're able to get that dollar amount, the $58.70 of how much I'm actually taking home after a year of work. Okay, multiply that by 12. That's how you're how much you're actually taking home from that increase that they sold you on. Oh, it's 4.6%, that's the sticker price, okay? What you're actually taking home is $704 extra. Breadcrumbs, do you understand? That's what, when I say breadcrumbs and breadcrumbs, the sticker price doesn't account for inflation, okay? It doesn't account for your increased cost of living, your rent increase that just went up, okay? It doesn't account for quantitative easing where they're printing money and putting more in supply so your dollar is worth less, okay? It doesn't account for any of that, you got it? So I highly encourage you to do the math because if you do the math, you'll see, oh wait, I'm a slave forever. Oh wait, it's gonna take me six years to pay off this car payment. Oh, then it's gonna take me another 10 to pay off the loans. Oh, it's gonna take me another 30 to pay off my mortgage. If you don't walk on this quest with me of financial literacy, you will be a slave forever. Next. I put $304 car payment, 175 goes to principal. So that's a really good homework assignment. I highly encourage you guys to do it. Do the math on your carrot. And then the other homework assignment, not to backtrack, is to do the math, to do the audit on your debt, your income, and your overhead expenses to the dollar. What is your, list every single one of your debts, okay? And then the beauty about it is you can put them in order so that you can make a plan of attack of eradicating them. Then you put all of your overhead expenses to the dollar by month, right? And be very, very honest. If you're not honest, you're only doing yourself a disservice and then what is your income and then put, I want you to see the math what's your income gross like what they say that they pay you and what do you actually take home then subtract your take home by your expenses okay what are you actually what's your margin what's your net what are you actually keeping after you pay everyone else but yourself after you pay the government from what they pay in taxes what, what you pay in taxes after what you're paying your landlord from what you're paying in rent after when you pay the bank from your mortgage that you have that's a loan from your car that you financed from your credit cards from your student loans you're paying every single other person but yourself right so that therefore you're going to be a slave forever no until you pay yourself until you save yourself because no one's coming to save you right they don't want you to be free they don't want you to do the math they want you to be a slave forever and i put 175 goes to principal 129 goes to interest i.e the trash i.e the bank no as if the bank takes my full $304 car payment, yet they only pay down $175 to the principal. So they keep me as a lovely, good, docile slave forever. Little do they know that I'm going to be paying for it in full in just a few months. To escape, face the truth, it's your fault. That's the hero's rhetoric narrative. And then I put free June 2026, 20 months from now. I was checking to see that my other card is charging. And I put, and I referenced psychology of money, but we touched upon that, rational versus reasonable. And it, what, it's Dave Ramsey in his book, uh, The Baby Steps. I think it's the seven baby steps, the five baby steps. I think it's seven. 
um, where it's rational to pay off high interest debt first, but it's not reasonable. Reasonable isn't what got you in the rat life debt slave trap that you're in right now to begin with. But reasonable is to pay off smallest debt first, even if it doesn't have as high of an interest rate. And then full attack on the lowest, and then you go to the next, to the next, to the next. Until you get all of yours to zero. I remember Jim Rohn said it in a video. He said that he did the math, right? Which everybody has to do if they ever want to be financially free. And he remembered the day that he was 100% debt free, that he was, you know, and it's so cool in the hero's journey where you're sort of like, you know, walking on the same path of the greats before you. And I remember when he said that he was, you know, 25 years old, he was behind on his promises. And that's the exact same boat that I'm in is, you know, behind on my promises. I said, I would take this person to Switzerland. I said, you know, that I, I, I'm supposed to be here at this age, like financially. And it's so cool that now from this you know, level of activity and focus, eliminating, eradicating all of the distractions from my freedom. Now I can see the path very clearly of how I'm gonna to get to debt free. And then I can see the path, you know, enough to see how the progression is no longer linear, it's exponential after you get to zero. Because think about it, you, once you're actually at zero, you're not bleeding from interest, right? How many of you guys are paying the minimum balance on your credit card? And so that just perpetuates. But imagine if you didn't have a, a interest rate, interest credit card payment from a monthly minimum. You didn't have that. Imagine if you didn't have a car financing payment. Imagine if you didn't have, if you didn't have a mortgage debt. <laughs> imagine if you didn't, have, for your house being paid off. <laughs> it's a joke in the modern day world. Um, unless you were one of my lucky viewers who were just given a house that was you know, paid for with six coconuts <laughs> in the 1950s. <laughs> That'd be nice, man. I wish I had that deal. <coughs> Point is, you'll realize that... I don't remember where I was going with it, but the whole idea is, until you do the math, you'll... The beauty about it is you learn that it's exponential. It's, it's not linear, you know? But you'll never get there unless you just have that honest audit of where you are right now. So I put you have to be focused. You cannot get distracted. The only reason I'm playing the Rat Life game is to be free forever. This is my notes. Five years of work and my family is free for a lifetime. And I put that's child's play. And it's very true, man. What is the alternative? The alternative is you do what everybody else does. You, you speak like they speak. You spend like they spend. You buy things you don't want or need to impress people you don't like with money that you don't have to be happy for the internet, in, in, internet for people who don't give a shit about you, right? I just, I, I don't understand that. And I've done that for years when I would travel just to post where I was. It was this look at me kind of a thing. But then I asked myself, if you didn't post this, if you, you know, in terms of changing the lens of, I, I really want to travel to this place. And it's like, do you really want to travel there? Or do you really want to post that you're, you're there? It's a very humbling question. It's like, would you do that trip without posting, without a phone? And it's like, oh, I don't really want to go there. I want the clout of, hey, look at me, look where I went. So when you actually have that humility and you realize you're living your life for the internet, for the, the admiration of your peers who really don't care about you, um, you'll realize that you're not playing the right game now. And the casualty of that game is your freedom, is your abundance, is your and your family's freedom forever. And the, um, the consequence is your enslavement for a lifetime. And I put drift, play the game. This is what happens if you don't play the game to win. The alternative is you drift. You play the game asleep, blind, and you will blink and have been enslaved for 50 years. Like that's, that's the reality. That's most people's reality. And I put, it's time to wake the F up. It's time to escape. And he breaks it down in the book, but I'll just relay it to you, that you have your job, which elicits your salary. And where does your salary go? Taxes, mortgage, plus insurance, plus interest, plus PMI, plus property tax, car, plus, in, plus insurance, plus the interest on that car note, credit cards, plus the interest, student loans, plus the interest. What does that mean? What does that translate to? You pay the government, you pay the bank, you pay the landlord, you pay everyone but yourself. Now you're trapped in the rat race. Now you're in the rat life. That's the rat life, baby. 
If you find you have dug yourself into a hole, stop digging. It took me many, 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 many years to stop digging. And even after I stopped digging, I would dig little holes and I explained it to where I would book flights. Um, you can view it as sabotaging my financial freedom, but when I look back in hindsight and reflection, I created, I artificially manufactured hope. And so, and I even put that as my next note, my self-sabotage was um, number one, my mom's finite timeline. So I would, you know, take my mom on Euro trips because I didn't know when she was gonna die. And I would rather, you know, charge a trip. I wouldn't care about the, you know, consequences of it financially, because if this was the only time that I'd be able to take her to Europe for the lifetime that she sacrificed for me and my four siblings, I was happy to do it. Um, and then I put, I artificially manufactured hope. So I shared this in the last video, probably one of the last ones where, you know, I booked a flight to Berlin that I never went to, to Brazil that I never went to, to, to London, but I was gonna go to Europe that I never went to, to a festival that I never went to. And the reason was is because I didn't have any hope within my rat life, right? There, that couldn't, there was no light for me at the end of the tunnel, rejection after rejection after rejection of all these jobs, the last seven that I've you know, tried to, to level up. And so <clears throat> just like when I didn't have the motivation to go to the gym when I first started my you know, physical transformation journey, um, I would take pre-workout to force the action. And so I did the same here where I would not take pre-workout to force this action, which I had some PCAs prior to this long lecture, but we're still hanging in there. Um, but I would buy those flights to create a light for me to keep going on my journey when there was no light you know, left for me. And so I would artificially manufacture hope. And so I don't see that as self-sabotage because I didn't end up going on those trips, which I would have spent thousands of more dollars on. And so I, that's why I say I dug sort of a little hole, but it, for me, it was one step backwards for two steps forward. Um, but I like the idea that it's whatever it takes. Like you have to do whatever it takes to save your own life. You have to do whatever it takes to escape your rat life. Like it, it's gonna take that much. It's gonna ask that much of you. Like whatever the fuck it takes to be free, you know? Because what's the alternative? The alternative is you're a slave forever. The alternative is you live a life like everybody else. And, and my one that I have, which I just I refuse to do that. So you can tell my voice is getting rather hoarse, but we're gonna continue on. And I put whatever it takes. A person can be highly educated, professionally successful, and financially illiterate. And I put you can have a degree and be an idiot. Without a financial statement, which is when you break down debt, income, assets. Um, overhead expenses, that those four. You don't really know where you are in life's financial game. It's very true. It's like when you, you know, embark on a physical transformation, but you don't weigh yourself. You don't take off your shirt and take a picture of where you are. Or I would have people who wanted me to be their coach, but they would wear their, you know, leggings super high waisted, and it would just be you lying to yourself, you know, by putting it over your love handles, and it's just like, look at yourself honestly where you are this is how much I weigh, this is the amount of alcohol I consume, these are the drugs that I'm taking. Then we can make a plan to remedy your situation, to improve, to grow, to heal, to escape, to be free forever, right? But we can't get there if we don't know where we are. We can't get to financial independence, right? Just breaking even, or financial prosperity, or financial abundance, or freedom forever, if we don't know our starting point. If we don't know how much, what is our income? Do you actually, what, what, what do they say you make on paper and then what are you actually taking home? Out of what you're taking home, what's being allocated towards all of these expenses? Out of these expenses, what's being put towards principal and what's just being, being thrown in the trash to interest, right? Out of all of your expenses, if you chose to pay off all of your lowest you know, debt payments and you were able to eradicate those, how much money would you be saving that you're right now otherwise wasting, that you're just you're, you're bleeding financially, needlessly, right? When you do the math on what your salary increase actually equates to after the adjustment for inflation, and you see the breadcrumbs of the breadcrumbs that you're slaving over your rat life job for, right? How long would it take you to pay off any of those debts, right? How long would it take you to get to zero if you were actually honest, accounting for your student loans, credit card, car financing, mortgage, how long before you get to zero without any expenditure on entertainment or medical emergency or any of that? When you actually do the math, you'll be like, wow, I better get on it. 
wow, I don't really have that much time. Wow, if I don't do something, I'm gonna sleep forever. So, if you don't do the math of where you are, you will never get to where you wanna go. And the reason that I can have so much confidence in the absence of my, my financial statement reflecting of it, because it's exactly like when I was coaching people with their, their physical transformation. And I was like, even though I didn't have the years of experience, I had all of the knowledge and the wisdom. I was like, dude, just, just trust me. This is exactly how you put yourself in a caloric deficit. This is exactly how you give yourself refeed days. You will get your your shredded physique, the be your best physique you can possibly get is inevitable if you follow this formula, right? And very few people would give me the gift of trust, the gift of belief in the coach that I would one day have the potential to become, right? And those people would, I would get in the best shape of their life, right? Those who afforded me that the greatest gift you can possibly give someone, which is belief. And I feel the same way with my financial literacy. It's like, I understand that my current financial statement that I've been you know, transparent to share with you guys in this video, because I know it's nowhere near reflective of where I'm going in the future. That's why I don't care or have any um, reservations to share it with you now, because I know this too shall pass. I know how temporary this is because I've expanded the time horizon. I know where I'm going. I, I am financially literate enough to know where I'm headed, right? Which is actually beautiful because this is the next book. And I just wanted to share with you a quote really quick of what cybernetics is, or what psycho-cybernetics is. And when loosely translated from Greek, and so this is a two for one that you're gonna read in this lecture. This is a preview for the next book. Cybernetics means a helmsman who steers his ship to port. The contemporary definition of cybernetics is the scientific study of how people, animals, and machines control and communicate information. Psycho-cybernetics, a term coined by Dr. Maxwell Maltz, means steering your mind to a productive, useful goal so you can reach the greatest port in the world, peace of mind. Tony Robbins extrapolates it in his book, uh, Unlimited Power. Before the mind can work efficiently, we must develop our perception of the outcomes we expect to reach. Maxwell Maltz calls this psycho-cybernetics. When the mind has a defined target, it can focus and direct and refocus and redirect until it reaches its intended goal. I cannot wait to read that book, and it's actually going to be the first time I've ever read it. It's the same thing here with your financial literacy, of knowing where it is you want to go. And for me, I want to get to zero. Okay, and so because I did the honest audit of where I am, and I have this clear defined def uh, destination, now I can let go of how, because I don't know what, you know, unexpected bill or expense or family or emergency or sickness, whatever that might arise from here to there. But I know that through the power of your mind, your reticular activating system of focus and not getting distracted, that I will focus and direct and refocus and redirect. What's the secret word? Until I reach my goal, my desired target, my desired outcome. You can do the same. And that's why you don't need, uh, what, what I was saying is you don't need the, my, my current you know, circumstances in no way reflects my future horizon. In, in no way whatsoever, you know what I'm saying? Because yes, this was my fault, but yes, what's to come, that's my fault too. Okay. And you can do the exact same by taking responsibility, agency, ownership of your own financial destiny. Nice. Wealth is a person's ability to survive so many number of days forward. Or if I stopped working today, how long could I survive? I learned that when I did entrepreneurship. And when you want to escape the rat life, you want to give yourself a window. It's about six six months to a year is enough. Um, where you have you know six months to a year of overhead expenses um, as your savings, to where when you start your business, you don't need any sales while you're developing your brand. Or you can do what I'm doing right now, which is while you're working your rat life job, you're developing your brand, rat life or your personal brand, Tark House, and not needing it to monetize for many years. And then when you're getting at, when you're out of debt, then you're stacking your savings. And then at some point, there's a, there's a tipping point to where your rat life progression will only take you so far. And then your escaping the rat life progression will be linear, or will be exponential, not linear. Um, there'll be a tipping point to where you're earning more from your passion, from all the seeds that you, you've sown, watering it, for being consistent with your, you know, your value that you're giving other people through all of these lectures, um, to where you're actually earning more from your passion, from what you love, from what you would do for free for years than you ever could working your rat life job. And it'll get to the point when you invest over time through compound interest to where you won't be able to out earn what interest accrues in the positive way. Not what interest that you're, you're paying 
from all your, your slave debts, interest that you're earning from compound interest from your investments, right? Be it real estate, appreciation, or what you're uh, making cash flow, or stocks that you've invested over. Most people work for everyone but themselves. They work first for the owners of the company. And then I, I put give example of a personal trainer. So another thing that helped bridge the gap for me for my rat life was when I was working as a personal trainer, the sessions that you know I would sell people on, the single ones, were $85. The commission that I would be paid for out of that was $85 was $5. So if you account for my minimum wage, which at the time was $10, I'm, I'm closing people for $85, and the company is paying me $15 for that, for that session. So I get 15, they get 60, sorry, 70, yeah, 15 minus 85. Explain that to me, <laughs> explain that to me. That's you. That's the slave, dude, that's the slave. The company gets to keep 70 for the safety that they provide and you get to keep $15. And so what, I, what did I do? And I'm not recommending this to people, but I would just personal train people myself. I leveraged my social media platforms as my marketing and I was able to get my own clients. And one of my clients, after they left that job, they wanted to work with me. And so I was able to set the price, which I did very, very fairly. And I was able to pocket 100% of the income. And I scabbed. So what that means is I trained them out outside of a gym that I wasn't paying rent towards. So I was a little, a little hustler. Um, but yeah, when you, and that's gonna be the beauty one day when I have my own gym. Um, not that I want to, you know, personally train people, but uh, it's just I'm trying to explain. I'm explaining this or shedding light on this to break down that if you are a personal trainer or if you, you know, work a job based on commission, or if you work a job whatsoever, do the math on what, how much you would be able to pocket if you just ran your own business. You realize how financially you're getting wrecked because of how much you're doing all of the work and you're getting the scraps. Not only are you getting the scraps. The scraps that you're getting are taxed, okay? So you're getting the breadcrumbs of the breadcrumbs. That's what I say when I say wake up, right? When you're working the rat life, you are a slave's slave. You're getting the breadcrumbs of the breadcrumbs. And that the breadcrumbs that you finally get, those dollars, that you realize they're not even real, they're made up numbers on a screen that they can print out of thin air, right? You realize it's all a lie. The game that you're slaving for, it's all made up to keep you as a good slave that they can control, dude, for a lifetime. To keep you enslaved in, in a state of fear for a lifetime. That's the game. So you pay your owners of the company first, right? You pay the government for what they take out in taxes, and then you pay the bank for, you know, who owns your mortgage, your credit cards, the car that you finance. And so, I put 2.7 months of work this year. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, this is a fun exercise. If you'd like to do this as well, this is a, this is a optional homework assignment. So optional, optional homework is how much of your job are you working to pay the government? And so it's a very simple equation. So if I make on paper six thousand four hundred and twenty dollars, and my take home is four thousand nine hundred and thirty six dollars. That means I'm, I'm taking home 0.76% of what I earn on paper. You take that number and you multiply it by 12, okay? And, and that's the amount of months that you're paying the government. <laughs> because think about it, if I'm taking home 0.76% of my salary, that means 0.24% of that salary and I understand that I'm overseeing the, what's you know being withheld for your retirement account, but for the sake of the you know the math equation, just roll with me on this. 0.24 percent is going to the government, which the calculators is essentially going to the government as well. And that's a whole other conversation of what you're saving towards your retirement, the, the, that is pre-tax money. And so if you withdraw it before you're 59, there's a it's like a, I, I did it once when the first time I skipped the rally. It's, it's a 38% penalty. 10% is with early withdrawal, 10% is another tax, and then there's another one because you took it out before you're 59. Um, you just get financially wrecked. And then if you do, you know, make it to the 59, then 
they need to tax it first because that's pre-tax money. You get it? And so that's why you have what's called a Roth IRA, which is another thing, not that I've overwhelmed you with knowledges, um, that's after tax money. So first they, you pay the tax on it and then it compounds you know, yeah. tax free. And so you see that, if you do the math on that, what my take home is, 4,936, divided by what my piece of paper, you know, gross income, what I'm getting paid is 6,420, it's 0.76%. So I'm, I'm taking home 0.76% of my salary, meaning I'm not taking home 0.24%. And so what's 0.24 times 12? 2.77 months. So 2.77 months of work each year is for the government as a good slave. <laughs> it's just a fun optional, you know, homework assignment, a, ma a math exercise that, you know, I'd encourage you to do if you'd like to just, you know, be happy. <laughs> financial struggle is often the result of people working all their lives for someone else, as we just explained. Use your financial knowledge to, simplify, to simply find an escape. And so true, dude, use your financial knowledge, use your mind to find an escape. And it starts by doing the math. An employee with a safe, secure job without financial aptitude has no escape. That's very true. Let's get them dice. We're going to do it. We're going to do as many as it takes of these until I give you guys all the gold, even if I look like an Oompa Loompa for all of them. And even if I lose my voice. It's already 6.22 p.m. Okay, so I need to eat dinner. One thing that was really exciting that I haven't tapped into yet, because I'm not on this stage of my financial progression, um, but I learned from this book, is what's called a 1031 Tax Deferred Exchange. It's really, really cool. And it's how, you, how wealthy people get around paying capital gains tax. What capital gains tax is, is when you sell something, when you sell a stock, when you sell an asset, when you sell your home, you have to pay what's called capital gains tax. As in, you make this amount of capital, you made a capital gain, well, the government has to take its share, right? No, no, well, uh, we sold this house, we sold this stock. <laughs> Uh, it's like that meme of Russia. We found oil. <laughs> or that's the United States meme. You know, is we. Uh, oh, hey, I found oil. You know, it's like a country, an Arab, a Middle Eastern country, and then we found oil. <laughs> Section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code, the IRS. IRS code, which <clears throat> allows a seller to delay paying taxes, capital gains tax, on a piece of real estate that is sold for capital gain through an exchange, there's a loud airplane. There was an airplane and I had a cough, so we paused it. I'm, a, I'm just gonna repeat it. And I'm gonna drink water, this is crazy. Relax, slow down. Section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code, which allows a seller to delay paying taxes on a piece of real estate that is sold for capital gain through an exchange for a, <clears throat> for a more expensive piece of real estate. So what that means is when you can sell a real estate property, right? And you made a capital gain on it. Rather than paying taxes, the capital gain tax on that gain, you can defer by putting that win into what's called a 1031 tax deferred exchange. As long as you keep trading up in value, so as long as you use that gain and put it on a down payment towards a bigger deal, right? More expensive home, multi-unit property, an apartment complex. As long as you keep trading up in value, you will not be taxed on the gains until you liquidate, which means until you sell and cash out. Meaning, you can defer paying the capital gains tax on a property for up to seven years by doing that tax deferred exchange. So if you keep doing that and keep leveling up and upgrading from going from, say, you you know buy a home and you sell that, the single unit, and you put that gain into a 1031 exchange, and then you put that towards a duplex, triplex, quadplex, apartment complex, you defer the taxes that you are required to pay on that for seven years, and you just keep doing that and you never liquidate it, and then you just you know, rent those out to tenants, you can avoid paying capital gains tax for a lifetime. So it's how, another way how rich people stay rich. That's from what? Financial literacy. That's from what? Finding a way to use the tax code, which is just a blueprint of how you can avoid paying taxes that the slaves, the financially illiterate, otherwise pay. Does that make sense? So I was excited when I read that, even though it's not a tool for me now, the beauty about this lovely quest of this university is that it could be a tool for me to come. Or you're further ahead on your financial progression than me and you can already leverage that now. And maybe perhaps you didn't know about it. Everybody wins. The future Tark wins. 
the person who's currently winning in their financial game wins, or the person who's never even heard of this wins because they're like, oh wow, what else do I not know? Okay. And yes, I put 20%, that's what they would otherwise take. 20%, just cause, <laughs> just cause they can, just because you're their slave if you don't know the game. He didn't understand that by relying solely on a paycheck from a corporate employer, employer, I wrote this down because it's hilarious. I would be a docile cow ready for milking. <laughs> it's true. How many of you listening or sitting, watching at home with your popcorn? How many of you are a docile cow, good and ready for your milking? How many of you are getting milked? How hard are you getting milked right now between all of your bills, all of your expenses, all of your debts, all of your credit cards, your car that you finance, your student loan bills, your mortgage, how hard are you getting milked right now by your ignorance, by your neglect of writing out your financial statement of where you are right now? How many of you are getting milked? How long are you gonna continue tolerating getting milked for? From the beginning of this lecture, what you tolerate is how you choose others how to treat you. What are you tolerating? I was talking about disrespect from what my friend that I was healing, that's what he was tolerating. Are you tolerating getting milked? There's like war going on outside. I don't know what that is. I think it's another airplane. That's okay. I'll talk over it. It'll pass. I wanted out of the employee trap. I badly wanted out of the rat race. And I put that, that sentiment, that knowledge is not necessarily learning something new, but it's learning to behave in a new way that we haven't previously behaved. And that ties in with the sentiment that we learned from The Richest Man in Babylon, a book that I've actually lended to someone. How beautiful is that? I'm actually lending books to others who are also on their own noble quest. I love that so much. This university just keeps on giving. And one day I'll have the most beautiful library. That I believe it'll be the most beautiful garden that'll attract people from all over the world to seek my literature. The Richest Man in Babylon, a part of all you earn is yours to keep. Do you remember that? A part of all you earn is yours to keep. And he said, say it in the morning, say it at night, say it every single moment of every day. Part of all you earn is yours to keep. And I'm applying that principle with my CalPER. So with, with my, my work 401k, what automatically gets withdrawn. So in the future, I plan to, when I exit the rat life, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna transfer, I'm gonna roll over my CalPERS to a Roth IRA. And then I'm, I think my plan is to max that out, my, my Roth IRA and my woman's Roth IRA. And then I put, um, by simply doing that, I put my daughter is a millionaire by the time she's 21. And I, I, I honestly, I don't wanna get into it in, in the sense of financially illiterate parents gave their kids such a leg down in life because you know, had I had a Roth IRA compounding since I was zero, which is something you can do for your kid, you can hire them on on your business as a marketer because there's no age restriction on a Roth IRA and you can have that money compound from the time that they're zero to the time and pay them, you know, $14,000. And so what, you know, gets paid after taxes that you can actually write off, is, is a write off that you can have. Um, because money that gets contrib contributed to a Roth IRA is after tax dollars. You can max out a Roth IRA for a zero year old until they're 21, that just compounds. And then the, in the what you make on that, you can reinvest the earnings. And that's how compound interest works. And if I were to know you know, that, or if I would have that happen to me, boom, I'd have that locked up, which there are people who, they get that game. Um, if you have, um, you can have a kid get signed on as a co-person to your credit card. And so you can have a zero year old <laughs> have 18 years of excellent credit card history to where when they're 18, then they can take out, you know, they can get approved for this mortgage or this, you know, real estate deal or, or whatever. You can just give these gifts to your kids, man, by financial literacy crazy. So that's what I plan to do with my daughter in the future. My son, he's going to learn the hard way like myself. He's going to go through the trenches. He's not going to be given a fucking dollar. My daughter, who I can spoil endlessly because you can spoil women. Women are actually, I find, a lot better the less amount of trauma that they have um, in the sense of they're not hardened, but and so they're much more softer 
kinder, sweeter. They're, they're, they're less bitter, they're less masculine. Versus men, I've never seen a made man in the absence of hardship and struggle and adversity because then you don't cultivate perseverance or work ethic or heart. Um, so you want to be a guy who goes through hell because then your character is forged as a result of going through that. But I don't want to put my princesses through hell. I, <laughs> you know, they're going to be spoiled endlessly. <laughs> and so that's an easy way to set them up for life is something like a Roth IRA. Moving on. But that's from the Riches Men Bad One, and that's how I'm applying it, it's with my CalPERS. So part of all you earn is yours to keep. My money was working hard to make more money. Each dollar in my asset column, this is literally reminiscent of the Riches Men Bad One, and I even put it in here, each dollar in my asset column was a great employee, a gold slave, working hard to make more employees, other copper slaves, and buy the boss a new Porsche with before tax dollars. So that's what he means by your money. The, rich, the poor and middle class work for money. The rich don't work for money. As in, they have money work for them. As in, my money was working hard to make more money. Each dollar in my asset column, so buying real estate, not a single unit, family home as we discussed, it's not an asset, because that's taking money out of your pocket. You can tell I'm losing my voice, it's getting more and more hoarse. We're finishing this lecture. Or stocks, right? That gives you a drip, that gives you a dividend that you can reinvest those earnings, okay? That's how you get money to work for, or you get money making money. That's how you get your money to work for you instead of working for money. Does that make sense? That's the difference, is using your money to buy assets that make you money and you use those money to make more money. So you have your money working for you versus you trading your time for money working your route life job. By using the lessons I learned from my rich dad, I was able to get out of the proverbial rat race at an early age. The road to wealth is through striving to increase your monthly cash flow from the asset column to the point that it exceeds your monthly expenses. Oh, yeah. We went over that. Once you accomplish this, you are able to get out of the rat race. It's very true. It's just, a, it's just a game of math and it's inevitable. Your freedom is inevitable so long as you are honest with where you are and you, you, you're honest that it's you are the reason you are where you are. It's your fault. And as soon as you take ownership and responsibility, even if it feels like you're not, you're not your fault, but you give yourself the power to change your situation, that's the day that you do. And that's the day that your future um, quest begins and your future destiny gets, um, all of a sudden becomes possible. All of a sudden it becomes real. It becomes true, it's true. The players who get out of the rat race the quickest are the people who understand numbers and have creative financial minds. But think about it, guys. Like You can't have a creative financial mind if you're not in a position to think. And you can't think if your mind is constantly s distracted, if your mind is saturated by dopamine from scrolling on in Instagram and YouTube shorts and TikTok reels, right? You have to cure your mind to be able to think to be able to listen, to be able to even have presence in listening to this video, man. Most people don't. Most people, this will fall on deaf ears. You know what I'm saying? Most people, this next part, risky five years of work, not risky 50 years of slavery, right? Most people are not gonna awaken even from this video. They're not gonna do the math. They're not gonna do the financial statement. They're not gonna do the homework assignments. They're not gonna write out where they are. They're not gonna ever do the audits of, oh wait, if I do this, dude, I'm a slave for life. Oh, if I do this, it's gonna take me 28 years to pay down $10,000 in debt because I'm only earning, yeah, on paper, thousands more per year by this promotion. No, no, it's a carrot. I'm only earning an extra $706 when I account for inflation. It's just math, you understand? But you can't even do the math if you don't have this basic foundation of financial literacy. The poor and middle class work for money. They trade their time for money. The rich make money. The more real you think money is, the harder you will work for it. If you can grasp the idea that money is not real, you will grow rich faster, like we discussed. Then at night and on weekends, she could be writing her greatest novel. And I put best-selling author. For, that was a note for myself, because one day I'll be, my book will come out. And so that was just, I love that when you're on your hero's quest, there, I, I feel like there's certain things that I read in these books that are just written for me, and that was one of them. 
And so I get to read my notes later on. It's just like a little note to myself, not just for the sake of everybody. Yeah. Being around it, money, education, you learn. This was another insight into the book by just the idea that you're the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with, but the, the idea that if you just surround yourself with people who talk about something, that's what you're going to become, that's what you're going to learn. And I learned this firsthand within education, working in school districts. There's things that I didn't know, like I didn't know what a pathway was, what a curriculum outline was, what, you know, there was a lot of things that I didn't know on budgeting, on, um, you know, what an MOU was. I can go on and on with a bunch of different random made up acronyms, right? But just by being in education, being surrounded by these things, learning, you know, how to make a board agenda, I was able to learn these things just based on vicinity. The same can apply for money. And the same is the, the consequence, the casualty of your education by choosing to surround yourself with losers. With people who just talk about gossip, the news, celebrities, the radio, you know, garbage. Garbage, verbal garbage and poison and, and parasite and disease, cancer into your garden, right? Pesticide. Versus choosing to surround yourself with people who talk about growth, which I don't have, man. I don't have surroundings of people who let's talk about dreams and ambitions and goals and, and targets and businesses we want to start and, you know, plans for our financial freedom forever. Dude, I don't have friends like that. I don't have family like that. It's taboo. It's nobody wants to look at it where they are. It's no, I'll look at it later. It's yeah, and so that's why you're gonna get the results you're gonna get, right? But the, and I learned this from Kobe Bryant. It's that quote that I said earlier that when the student is ready, you know, the, the master appears, the teacher appears, you know, when you're on your quest, the world becomes, this quote from Kobe Bryant is like, when you choose the day that you're gonna become a student that you wanna learn, the world becomes your library, right? And it's very, very true, and I've noticed that even with my hero's quest, even having the syllabus, for the university of the thousand books, right? It is when I decided that this is a thousand book quest, um, I was given the insight and the intelligence and the guidance and the creativity and the, uh, you know, I was guided towards, you know, a very, very good um, syllabus draft of the thousand books that's gonna be, you know, within this university. Yes, it will change, but a lot of them won't. And so you have everything that you need before you even start. You know, the world had became my library. And, you know, not, uh, no pun intended, but it'll actually um, actualize as an actual library one day. Dude, one of the best ones ever curated, yeah, ever put together, which I'm very excited about. I, I've said it before, but this library that I'm, you know, creating, that I'm amassing, that I'm curating right now. This will be the greatest gift that I ever give anyone in my entire life. It's very, very true. So being around it, you learn just by being in the room of the conversation. And also it's to your detriment. It, you, you get worse by just being in the conversation of the gossip and the negativity and the, the excuses and the garbage, right? Who do you think you're going to become, right? If you're surrounded by losers, if you're surrounded by the negative, if you're surrounded by the excuse ridden victims, right? The cowards, dude. The pests. You're gonna become that. Job, acronym from the book, just over broke. Who thought? Rich Dad thought it best to go broke before 30. You still have time to recover. Thank you, Rich Dad. It's very, very true. And it's very, very true because from all of the lessons and all of the, the wisdom that I have now that you only get from experience, um, now, going into my next stage, I'm 29 right now, entering the, the next saga, which is going to be my 30s, um, I'll be able to, you know, do what other people won't and live a life other people can't because they didn't have the courage when they were in a position to go broke to have the courage to pursue. So now those people have positioned themselves to where they have to work their job for necessity. They don't know the resourcefulness that comes from pursuing entrepreneurship or starting a business or by going all in, by burning their boats. Um, and so those people, more likely than not, aren't going to change, aren't going to grow, aren't going to go for it because they're so reliant from how deeply embedded they are in the trenches of their rat life, you know, from a lack of courage of looking at their situation, honestly, taking that snapshot, right, writing out that financial statement of where they are right now, 
that their slavery is going to be forever. They're so now, like that quote from The Matrix, they're so reliant on the system that they'll even fight to defend it. And that's where the quote comes from, most men lead quiet lives of desperation because they want to quit their job, they want to pursue their passion, but they're reliant on their slave paycheck. What we just, you know, discussed is the breadcrumbs of the breadcrumbs because they need that slave wage, right, to feed their kid, to pay for their family, to pay for their overhead. And so now they can't take risk because of that. That's the game. So that's the rat, that's the rat race, that's the rat life. Trapped in the lifelong process of paying bills, becoming like a hamster, running around in those metal wheels, your fury legs are spinning furiously, turning the wheel furiously, but come tomorrow morning, they'll still be in the same cage. Very true. You can work harder and harder and harder to get that salary increase, that promotion. But do the math, dude. Do the math. Adjust for inflation. What are you actually netting? You're, you're in the same slave wheel. You're getting the same breadcrumbs. But you don't realize the slave... You don't realize the slave that you are. You don't realize the prison that you're in until you wake up, until you face music, face the truth. The more specialized that you become, the more you are trapped in that specialty. So this comes from the fear of the fear of starting over. So modern day indoctrination that they call education, it encourages you to specialize because if you pursued your doctorate in this specialization and you want to start over, Oh man, no, no, I can't. Most people, they, after getting a doctorate in medicine, they're not, they, it takes a lot for them to be like, okay, now I'm gonna start over into my, what my actual passion is. Cause you lose what? Not just the income cut, but you lose the status, you lose, you know, the perceived opinions, you know, and weights of what your peers, people who don't give a shit about you. Um, those are all things that you're losing, which is your significance, which is another human need. You're losing certainty. I don't know where my, you know, how I'm going to make ends meet by starting to pursue my passion. I don't know how I'm, I'm going to monetize it. So the idea is they want you specialized, right? And that's how the more that you're specialized, the more specialized you become, the more you are trapped in that specialty. And you see why. And I put... Uh, that's not the case for me because I've done entrepreneurship, I've done life coaching, personal training, I was an alchemist for a time, you know, conjuring pre-workout with my brother, an educator now, professor, author to come, and I put farmer because I have enacted that quote for years because I'm a healer at the end of the day, which is life is about planting trees. Excuse me. I'm going to show you will never sit. This is from the book. Make it, make it a practice to give first. Teaching is one way of giving. The more you give, the more you receive. Give money, to receive money, give lots. And I learned that when I was in, ah, I'm gonna pause this because I really need to go to the bathroom. Oh my gosh, dude, I had to go to the bathroom so bad. Usually I've been able to hold it for these lectures, but this one is so long that I was like, I cannot wait a single moment longer. More information than you wanted, but that's the truth. And I had some honey, so I got a little bit of sugar in me. Woo! So we'll be able to finish this lecture strong because what I don't want to do is rush it. As in, I did that with one book, and I felt myself doing that a tiny bit now, and I said, I'm not gonna do that. I want all these lectures to be done properly, even if I'm on no sleep, even if I'm looking like an Oompa Loompa in you know, the picture quality here, I'm just like, I'm not doing this to not lay these bricks properly. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm trying to lay it one brick at a time, one brick at a time, one brick at a time. And if I just rush these, then I won't be able to build what I'm trying to build, so in essence of that, in light of that. Um, yes, I was gonna say, I learned that from Dolly, Serbian girl, Kosovar, uh, in Kosovo, when I was in Europe. And she said that to me, she said, I always give money away, and I always find it coming back to me, even more than I give. And so that's the idea here, make it a practice to give first. It's the idea from the Bible, as you sow, so shall ye reap. As in, when you plant an apple seed, do you get one apple? No. When I plant an apple seed, I get a bushel of apples, right? You are rewarded with 10 times what you give. You understand? They get a practice to give first. And I like this. Teaching is one way of giving. So that's like what I'm doing with these lectures. The more you give, the more you receive. 
give money to receive money. Give lots. And I put, give and, give and it shall be given unto you. Failure inspires winners and defeats losers. Take your failure and turn them into rallying cries. I really like that idea from the book. That is the formula for all winners. That's very true. It's like, there's a good quote by Andrew Tate and he said that everything that you're going through right now that you know is so bad, one day you're gonna look back and be thankful that you went through it. But you know, you can't see when you're in the when you're so buried in the trees that you can't see the forest, you can't see how life is happening for you. But I, well, I was listening to a, such a great audio by Joe Dispenza and he was talking about how, you know, when you're in alignment, when you're in harmony with the flow of the universe, it's when you're completely trusting in the sort of divine, you know, process and fate's design that everything that you're going through right now is happening for you. And when you do that, you see that in real time, all of the bad things, you, you, you let go of the narrative that this is happening to me and you allow the trust that none of this is happening for me. And it's that very trust where you flow the fastest and you actually get to the destination that you want, you want to go to the quickest by letting go of how you need to get there. And I had such a great insight the other day on a walk and I said, this was such a good analogy. It was like, okay, I want to get to this destination, right? <clears throat> While I'm driving there, I run out of gas and I need more gas. And what if life gives you the fuel, but it's not written, it's not, you know, advertised as gasoline, but it's advertised as, you know, heartbreak or injury or depression and I thought wow so because all of those things when used constructively they're infinite fuel infinite motivation the most transformative of my years has been or of my within my journey the most transformative times in my life has been when I've been decimated when I've been wrecked when I've been heartbroken when I've you know been just infuriated right when I've been so angry and pissed off when I was my you know seventh or sixth um, yeah, it was the sixth time that I got rejected from um, the interview I made it to the final interview the second time of what would be a six-figure job the promotional version of my current job and I was so mad and I said fuck this and I said I'm not I said I'm deleting this app and I'm deleting Instagram I redownloaded it so I could FaceTime my mom just for full transparency. But I was like, I'm deleting all these distractions. I'm not spending money here. I'm not worrying about buying a flight. I said, no, no. I said, I'm getting free. I don't care what it takes, right? It's as if I'm driving in my car and that's the gas station for me to get to where I wanna go. You know what I'm saying? But rather than gasoline, it's just titled, you know, <laughs> seventh job failure or sixth job failure or you know heartbreak or you know disappointment or let down or rock bottom but or you know depression or whatever the case may be for you this battery's gonna die so let me replace it hold on but i think if you can understand that concept you'll begin to understand that the idea that life happens for you always right but we just have a conditioning to view all the negative experiences in our life as happening to us like this is not what's supposed to happen this is not the path right but in Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, because we have the power to adapt, because we have the power to overcome, he says, the obstacle becomes the way. There's somebody outside. And that's the game, you see? So imagine you're driving your car and then you're running out of gas, which is, you can extrapolate that as, I'm running out of motivation, I'm running out of inspiration, so I'm taking less action, you know, I'm not really feeling it. And so you say you want this, God, the universe, nature, uh, divine intelligence, faith, they say no problem. Let me give you what you, let me give you what you want. Let, let me help you reach your destination. But they advertise it not in the form of here's fuel happening for you, for your journey, for you to get you exactly where you want to go but it'll be advertised or you'll, it'll be found in the form of heartbreak, depression, you know, job uh, getting fired, 
um, job interview rejection, a woman in rejection, whatever. Do you see? No, no, this didn't happen to you. This gave you the fire. This gave you the fuel. This gave you the kerosene that lit on fire, that, that lit that fire under you where you said enough, where you said not another day, where you said I'm gonna do whatever it takes. You see? It's all just perception. It's all just perspective. That's you viewing the lens of life happening for you. And then the sooner that you do that, the quicker that you'll be able to flow to your destination, to exactly where you say that you want to go. It's all, it all happens for you. It was all required to happen for you to get to your greatest potential. I said this in the talk that I was giving the other day for the guy that I was healing. And I said, I was quoting from Marcus Aurelius in Meditations that all nature does what's in the best interest of its nature. As in, a tree will grow as tall as it possibly can. A fruit will bear as much fruit as it possibly can. And so, in your nature, in human nature, right, every circumstance, every condition that's possibly happening is happening for you. It's happening for your best interests because it wouldn't make sense otherwise. Because no nature in existence does what's not in its own best interest because that wouldn't make sense. If you think of your existence, like it talks about in meditations, as the collect as as a part of the collective of, of the human race of human nature right then your design your your role your cog in this bigger wheel right it's in its best interest to make you your best for you to become your best why because if you become more that quote life is not about what you get it's about who you become and what you're able to give that you, that you become more by you becoming more, right? Everyone around you, their lives improve, and by all of their lives improving, the whole nature benefits. Do you see? So why would nature not want you to become your best? It would be in its greatest disinterest, right? So like any nature, a tree, fruits, human nature is no different. When you understand that concept, that idea that you are a part, a branch on a tree, part of the whole, piece of the collective, right? The whole, uh, he calls it in the alchemist, the soul of the world. It's all one. It's all one and the same. When you understand that, you understand that everything in your life is happening for you. And that requires probably the greatest degree of humility. And that's probably peak level of enlightenment and understanding is complete and utter trust in that no matter what no matter the death no matter the atrocity no matter the hardship no matter the you know how terrible something is no no this this had to happen for some reason that that my mind can't conceptualize but i trust that this needed to happen for this betterment this greater design that i can't see and then that's when you can bring God into the game, etc. But I think you get the idea, and I love that so much. Um, the main reason that over 90% of the American public struggles financially is because they play not to lose. They don't play to win. It's very true. If you have a little money and you want to be rich, you must first be focused, not balanced. And I love this next quote. Thomas Edison was not balanced. He was focused. Donald Trump is focused. And I put Tarek Haux is focused. And then he put focus e mean, it's an acronym for follow one course. And I circled this until successful. That's the secret. Belief, potential, action, result over time until. I know. All right. People who are filled with doubt and so does that make sense to, to be focused? As in, are you constantly distracted? As in, are you starting with this thing? And then, eh, and then going to another thing? Eh, and then going to another thing? Alex Ramosi calls it going into the valley of despair. And that's the whole, it's a recurring cycle of the entrepreneurial um, path. And so, you, I don't want to get into it in this lecture, but the idea is when people get into the valley of despair, then they start something new and then it's just a cycle that repeats and perpetuates versus if you just hang on 
that same thing, that same venture, until you'll eventually break through. But most people don't do that because they quit and they give up right before that clay is about to transform, right before your physique is about to transform, right before your finances, your, your financial prosperity and wealth is all about to, you know, be promised to you and be given to you. Most people give up, most people quit. And that's why most people are not free. People who are filled with doubt are willing to accept a far lower, lower return. And you put, doubt is expensive. Oh, yeah. I just liked it, that's how I wrote it. When someone says, I don't want to fix toilets, they're saying a toilet is more important. So this is the idea of people not wanting to invest in real estate. Uh, they're saying a toilet is more important than what they want. I talk about freedom from the rat race and they focus on toilets. And I put living in my car for 93 days. I wanted to be free. I did the math on what it would take to pay off the principal, which, which in total was you know, just over $12,000 from my venture of Rat Life, the pre-workout supplement company. And I did the math on what my job was, I did the math on what my overhead expenses were, and I did the math on what my net was, my take home. And I said, if I live in a place where I'm paying rent, I will have this fucking debt for two years. And I said, there's no world where I'm doing that. I said, I'm, I want to be free, whatever it takes, I don't care. And I said, I don't care if I have to live in my car to be free, and I did that. And for the first four months, because I, I was, for one of the months of September of 2023, I w spent some nights in a hotel just to give myself a break from living in a car. Um, but the 93 days was over the course from August all the way until I didn't move in this apartment until December 7th. And every single paycheck I was allocating to my brother, like my first margin from, uh, so I started work in July of 2023 at this job that I'm currently working. So my August paycheck, it was like $800, I siphoned in. My uh, August, September paycheck, it was a full paycheck, $2,500 to my brother. October, $2,500 to my brother while living in a car. November, $2,500 to my brother while living in a car. And then December, that $2,500 I put towards the rent of this apartment. And so I was able to pay just under $9,000 of that debt in such a short amount of time because I was willing to live in a car to be free. And so I, I put that in here that when someone has that, you know, that rhyme or reason, oh, I don't want to fix toilets from getting into real estate, Ew, your focus is so diluted. You're focusing on toilets. I'm talking about freedom. And then for me, for living in the car and paying off the debt, dude, I, I just wanted to be free. And this is from someone who had the courage to go all in and make his own failures starting a business. Imagine people who, you know, either they, they make a blunder so bad they can never recover from it. Like mine in total was a $15,000 mistake that took several years that I'm $2,000 away from finally completely remedying. Imagine people who, you know, they're, they went $100,000 into, into debt and then they're stuck forever, you know? Imagine people who are living the rat life forever and they've never done the math and they have to spend 50 years to pay off their debt or imagine they never pay off their debt ever. Like my university professor who went to get their master's degree and went to get their doctorate degree and they still have student loans to this day, right? It's like, where's your focus? Your mind is on freedom, freedom forever. And then a cool thing that he talks about is what's called a stop in stock market investing. And this is the idea that most people play to not lose or they don't play to win. But he breaks it down that it's a lot easier to not be concerned about losing when you know the game. So if you have stocks, you can put what's called a stop loss in it. And what that means is you set a, you know, a safety net to where your stock will trigger a sell if the, um, the the value of the stock falls be below a, thir a certain threshold. So if your stock is worth $50 and you put a stop loss for 40, that means as soon as it drops, if it were to drop to 40, it'll be it'll immediately sell, thus saving you, you know, oh, it could go to 30 or 20, and it saves you that loss. Does that make sense? So a stop in stock market investing is a command to sell your stock automatically if it falls um, below a certain price point. And so that's just an example of how you can protect yourself from your downside from financial literacy. Um, and that's just like another tool, another food for thought. 
The most common form of laziness, laziness from staying busy. I know someone all too well who just do, does, he, he doesn't understand the concept that, um, I learned this from Jim Rohn, that people, and from Tony Robbins, who Jim Rohn was his mentor, people mistake activity for achievement. And so it's actually the greatest form of laziness is by making yourself so busy with everything that has nothing to do with your, your main tasks um, that you waste hours and hours and hours and hours every day. But we learned from Marcus Aurelius' meditations that people who have that kind of arrogance, you can't um, instruct them, you can only endure them because they're not in a, they're not in a place to receive. So um, that is the most common form of laziness are people who mistake activity for achievement. So all you can do is uh, endure those people. Next. I can't afford it, we talked about, that shuts your brain down, how, I, how can I afford it? And this is kind of him summing up the book, um, opens up possibilities, excitement, and dreams. Wow. And then Brian Tracy's his, his mind storming exercise, so where you list 20 ways of how you can accomplish your, your most, your goal that would have the greatest positive impact on your life, which most people it's just earning more money. Because if I were to earn more money, then I'd be able to achieve this goal and this goal and this goal and this goal. So his mind swimming exercise is writing 20 ways you can think of, of how you can, for example, earn X amount of dollars. And the whole idea is you learning to use the power of your mind. He says, the first five will be easy. Yeah, I could work harder. I could get another job. I could do this. You know, I could start this business. He said, the first five will be easy. The next five will be harder. The, the 10 to 15 will be very, very hard. The last five are impossible. He said the last five though, in all of his years that he's ever done this exercise with millions, I don't know about millions of people, but tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of people, yeah. probably millions of people. He said those were the five that had the most, the greatest impact financially on everyone's life. That's created the most millionaires that he's ever, ever seen. It's the number one exercise he's ever done with any group of people to elicit, to yield the greatest amount of millionaires that he's ever done his entire career of personal development, you know, speaking, coaching, you know, mentoring, et cetera. And so what's the, what's the premise of that? Is using this, your greatest wealth creative creation tool, your mind. You can't use this if you never think. You can't think if you're constantly distracted, you're constantly focused, you're constantly absorbing the news and the radio and the gossip and you're talking to your loser friends, man. You can't think, you can't even sit still. How many of you can even read a book? When I started this quest of this noble university, this, university this, this noble quest of this university, I couldn't even sit still and read a chapter without needing stimulation because my mind was fundamentally broken from the scrolling, from the dopamine saturation. You have to cure your mind, right? So, <clears throat> food for thought. But the whole idea is think. Think for yourself. They don't want you to think. They don't want you to, because the second that you do, the second that you wake up, you realize how hard you're getting wrecked and the, the severity of the trap that you're in. It's not the goal, affording it, but the process of attaining the goal he wanted us to learn. And, the, and I, you can extrapolate that. He wanted his rich dad in the book to learn resourcefulness, to learn creativity, to learn how to use your mind, right? And the beauty about that is you learn all of that from entrepreneurship. When you go all in, like I did, when I you know, quit my job, cast out my retirement, sold my car, booked a one-way flight to Europe, pressure, and this is in my notes, pressure, urgency, forces creativity, forces you to work harder, and forces resourcefulness. It's very true. You will be blown away by how resourceful you become when necessity demands it. And like I said, yes, you can have a family member get sick. Yes, you can have a child to force that urgency. But I, I, I dream that one day, whoever's watching this video, you pursue entrepreneurship and you pursue starting your own business and you go all in because you'll be amazed at how resourceful you become when necessity demands it. Dude, you'll find a way. I got very creative on how to make ends meet, on, on how to feed myself, on how to pay my rent because, you know, I was like, when your rent is on the line, when you don't know when, you're, where you're, when or where your next meal is coming from, you get very creative, you get very resourceful. You tap into reserves in here you didn't know you had. And that's the beauty that gets forfeited 
from the security, from the safety, from the spoon feeding that is working a nine to five rat life job. It's the biggest uh, misfortune, in my opinion. When you nine to five, pay your bills first and yourself last, you never feel pressure. You stay broke. You never learn the beauty and how resourceful you become with a lifetime of being spoon fed. Forcing myself to think about how to make extra money is like going to the gym. The more I work, more I work, the more mental money, mental money muscles, the more mental, I, I think I omitted a word, the more work my mental money muscles get, the stronger I get, right? The more they work out, sorry, the more I work my mental money muscles out and the stronger I get. I'm at the end of my fumes here, man. <clears throat> but it's okay, we're almost done. And so it's very true, just like anything else, just like confidence, not practice, goes dormant. Um, your financial you know, creativity, insight, intelligence, resourcefulness, that diminishes if not practice. What I don't know uh, loses me money. And then this is a really good quote. I actually got this from Alex Ramosi, which he said shifted his mindset on money. How much is ignorance costing you? And so he had people write down what their overhead is. So for me right now, I make, you know, 77,000. Uh, I can do that for you guys right now really quick. Hold on, hold on. So if I make 6420 times 12, I make 77,040. This is what it's costing me to not know how to make a million dollars. It's costing me, my ignorance is costing me 922,000 and $960. It's just a good mindset switch. So you, if that's too big of a number to think of, it's costing me you know, $23,000 to not know how to earn $100,000. Even though I, I know how to earn $100,000, I just don't have, I just don't have that yet. Um, it's that same sentiment. What is ignorance costing you? And <clears throat> you can extrapolate this. Ignorance of you know, how to get in shape is costing you your health costing you diabetes, it's costing you, you know, having a higher chance of getting heart disease. How much is ignorance costing you of not knowing the law, of your attorney fees? How much is ignorance costing you of not knowing accounting and the accountant that you have to hire every tax season? How much is ignorance costing you, you know? And so I, I, I love that. I, that's something to really chew on. You know, how much is ignorance costing you? Is it, is it costing you your financial freedom by being financially illiterate? Is it costing you the best physique of your life? Is you not becoming this version of yourself costing you your dream woman, right? Your ignorance is costing you your fucking freedom, dude. Who for thought? There is gold everywhere. Most people are not trained to see it. And it's true. When you are on your path of your hero's journey, you get trained from your trust to identify opportunities. And I feel like opportunities are all around you all the time, but you just don't know that they're opportunities because you're not on your journey, on your path. At least I believe that because as I've grown and matured and developed, um, things that I probably in my adolescence would have viewed as happening to me, I realize happening for me, I realize are opportunities in the sense of, oh, this is an opportunity for challenge, for me to learn something, for me to grow some, from, from something for me to become something more so that I can turn have more to give others up. So this is an opportunity to test my emotional stoicism, to test my patience, to test my, you know, you know, emotional control amidst abundant arrogance and stupidity and laziness, right? It's all an opportunity. It's all a gift happening for me. There's gold everywhere, right? But it's all perception. It's all how the meaning that you give things. Is this happening to me? Is this happening for me? Or is this guiding me? What am I meant to learn or grow from this, right? The, the humble questions or the arrogant mantra, the sheep's mantra, the victim mentality. Food for thought. <clears throat> Smart investors don't time the markets. If they miss a wave, I really like this, they search for the next one and get themselves in a position. It's like what I'm doing with this job that I believe is gonna become a vacancy in six months from now is all I'm doing right now is sharpening my ax. There's a good quote by Abraham Lincoln. If you give me six hours to chop down a tree, I'll spend the first five sharpening my ax. Right now, I'm just positioning myself for that wave to come. Right now, I'm getting myself ready for the quote, luck 
is when preparation meets opportunity. So if I'm able to prophesize this, we're putting it out there, that I'll be earning $136,239 in eight months from now, that luck will be from months and months and months and years and years and years of preparation. So it's really, really cool. Next, and that's here from where we're going. This noble quest is gonna take you far beyond that, my friend. Next, 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 next is people. So I like that quote. Smart investors don't time the markets. If they miss a wave, they search for the next one and get themselves in a position. They don't cry over spilled milk. People who lack internal, fort in internal fortitude often become victims of those who have self-discipline. And it's that quote, if you don't have a plan, you'll be used by someone else as a part of their plan. So to repeat, people who lack internal fortitude, the, who lack the courage to pursue, the courage to look at their situation honestly for what it is, they often become victims of those who have self-discipline, who have the courage to pursue. They didn't have a plan or they had uh, the cowardice or they lived their life <clears throat> by fear. And so now they're used as the plan of somebody else. They're used as a part of their plan, right? Don't be that guy. Have your own plan. Where do you want to go? And then it, the whole premise of the university, which I, I always hammer at the end, but it's worth putting in here. Real Life University is it starts with belief. It's possible I can, I'm worthy, and the courage to pursue, dude, the courage to try, to fail, to feel this as this happened for me and not to me. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Are we all on the same path? Are we all students in this noble quest together of humility, of learning, of growing, of, of just being honest with where we are? Because, uh, dude, the success is inevitable, man. It really is. Like. Your current is temporary, it really is. And what's happening is happening for you. It really is. All things I know and all things I need to repeat to myself. Because it's all truth, right? Everyone has you living in a world to steal your attention, right? To distract you. But who's the casualty, man? It's your freedom, right? Because right now you could be living a life of freedom forever or at least on the path to freedom forever. But you choosing not to do the financial audit, you choosing not to, you know, embark on the quest of financial literacy, is you choosing to guarantee your slavery. I just, I don't understand what you have to lose dude, in, in the one life that you have. But for me, it's just, it's so exciting, the possibility of what to be, you know, what can be, you know, just by giving this a go, right? Just by embarking on this quest. like. At worst, we have a cool story to tell. At worst, we've created something beautiful that other people can you know, benefit from. Other people can um, have that shade from life is about planting trees under whose shade will never sit, right? We'll be able to transform dozens and hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people's lives just by having the courage to pursue, right? So I say go for it. I say what do you have to lose even in your one life? A good broker, I love this so much and I've applied this, should provide you with information as well as take the time to educate you. A good teacher should provide you with information, right? As well as take the time to educate you. And I put a good trainer. I would do this with my client, Amy. I would say a great trainer can get you to the point where you don't need them because while I'm training you, right? while I'm your trainer, your coach that you're paying for, I'm educating you along the way. And I think that's the best form of coaching, training, mentorship, everybody, is the greatest teachers, right? They don't just give you the fish, right? They don't just, it's that quote, you teach the man how to fish and then they could feed themselves for a lifetime. And if you teach people financial literacy, if you teach people, you know, excuse me, how to get in the best shape of their life, that's the best kind of teacher is the one where you set them up to where they don't need you. Opposite from one of the laws that we learned in the 48 Laws of Power, which I'm excited for getting back on this, but it's basically um, only telling people in this one, learn to keep people dependent on you by, you know, omitting and by keeping this and, you know, making them reliant on you. Forget all of that garbage, dude. Give people as much as you can. Give abundantly, dude. It comes back to you tenfold. 
Give, 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 and it shall be given unto you. Oh, <clears throat> but people, they live life in this zero-sum game. This person winning, this person exceeding and accelerating means they're losing. That's people, that's, that's you choosing to live in a state of lack. You know, choose, challenge yourself to have the courage to live in a state of abundance. Abundance. Got it? All right. Last little clip to fit. Here we go. Oh, this orange stuff is killing me, man. It really is. But we're committed. We're almost done. So we're in orange today, but maybe it's because of the... Maybe it's because it's nighttime and this light is on. I don't know. Whenever you feel short or in need of something, this is just the giving concept, hammering at home, give what you want first and it will come back in buckets. That is true for money, a smile, love, or friendship. And it's very, very true. It is give it first and you'll receive it. I noticed this when I smile outside, the quote, smile at the world and the world will smile back. It's just, it's a, the world is that sort of reflection. It's that mirror of you. So if you're somebody who's giving, if you're somebody who's living in a state of abundance, you'll find abundance flowing back to you. But if you're somebody who's living in a state of lack, of negativity, of hatred, of bitterness, you'll find, you'll see that within other people because it's a reflection of you. So he said, I want money, so I give money. And it comes back to me in multiples. It comes back in multiples. Moral of the story, he put this, make offers. And I put, he was talking about make offers on real estate. Like, and people are afraid to do that. If this house is listed for this much, just put this. And he said, very seldom do people list a place for less than its value. And so they're, they just want to negotiate. They just want to play the game. And he's, he talks about understanding that it is a game. And I put in my notes, and this is for the gentleman at home, make offers for women too. And I put, don't ask, you don't get. You know what I'm saying? And it's very, very true. Most guys are very timid. They're afraid to just ask either a woman out or they're afraid to ask or you know, broach the subject of this aspect of a relationship. I'll give you a good example. I used to have a lesbian friend, who's no longer my friend, who didn't have the courage to tell her partner she wanted to be in an open relationship. And I was baffled by that idea because <laughs> I was like, of all people, you should feel the most comfortable and the most confident to be yourself to be honest with who you are, how you feel, what you want. If anyone, it should be your partner. I can't imagine being in a relationship with someone where I felt uncomfortable or unconfident telling them what, what I thought would make me happy. And that's depressing. That's very depressing to be in a relationship where you're too much of a pussy to tell your significant other what you want out of fear. And the fear is, oh no, I'm gonna lose them. But then I challenge you to ask, why would you wanna be with someone where you couldn't be honest by being yourself or being honest with who you want or how you feel. And I've always said this and I stand by this, I believe this to the day I die. You don't lose anyone ever by being honest with who you are or how you feel, ever, ever, right? That quote by Dr. Seuss, and this is the reason why this is true. Be who you are and say how you feel because those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind. Those who matter don't mind. They'll love you for you regardless. So when he says make offers, if you don't have the courage, or not, not the courage, if you can't even be honest with yourself or with your partner with what you want, dude, you have some masculine, and this is the same with her, um, with the masculine feminine roles, because it's you have to have both in any relationship, even if it's girl, girl. I would question yourself. I would question your, uh, look at yourself in the mirror and question your, your masculinity, even if you're a, a lesbian woman. <laughs> but it's true, dude. If you if you don't even have the, what do you want to call them? The cojones, the 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 gall to be honest with what you want in the one life that you have. What the hell are you doing? What are we talking about? It's ridiculous. It, it really is. It, it's just it's pathetic. It's silly. It's and but that is extrapolates the quote in real time most men or women in this case lead quiet lives of desperation so because they're so afraid to be honest <laughs> they'll go their whole you know time in the relationship being unsatisfied being unfulfilled you know even if this thing isn't what actually makes them happy they don't even have the the courage to talk about it to open the idea to find out that no that's not what they want they wanted this but because think just think Use your mind. If you want these other things, if, you want, if you're looking for something out here 
it means you're not satisfied or fulfilled right here, right? People don't think, man. It's wild. But moral of the story, make offers. Don't ask, don't get. And don't deserve to get either. The game of buying and selling is fun. Keep that in mind. It's fun and only a game. Make offers, someone might say yes. And it's true. It's like, you know, for all you know, your partner's been wanting to have an open relationship. <laughs> And you're like, oh, you mean we could have had this this whole time? <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. We're almost done. If you want to be rich, you must know what kind of income to work hard for, how to keep it, how to protect it uh, from loss. That's the key to great wealth. Now escape the rat life. And that, my friends, is book number 21. And we did it, man. We did it with a hoarse voice. We did it after being sick. We did after this insight for this potential vacancy to come, which has given us a clear focus uh, for the next seven months. So I, I really hope I get to share that with you guys. But right now, so now I'm not looking for any other job. I'm not looking for any other thing. And I'm just working on solidifying focus in my diet, in my training, in my progression, in my routine, in my debt alleviation, in this noble quest of this university, in the development of reading these books. This is our 21st book that we've read in this year. So 2024, this is book number 21, which I think is pretty cool. You know, the most books I've ever read in my life before this university, it was um, like 26. And so it's gonna be cool in 2025 where I cross that threshold and I've read the most books that I've ever read in my entire life on personal development. And I've had people recently question like my wisdom, my, you know, this, um, where did I get my philosophies from? And a lot of it is from experience. A lot of it is from trial and error. A lot of it is from healing other people. But dude, a lot of it I've learned conceptually through these books that I've then applied and learned in the real world. Um, but there's so much gold in all of these books. That's why I'm creating this university. It's just one day, like I said, millions of people have access to this beautiful library. And this will be the greatest gift you ever give yourself if you need the key to escape your rat life. But it'll be the greatest gift for your children to give them the key to never be enslaved in the first place. Like imagine if you, on your quest, who has now become financially literate, now you can educate your daughter, your son, so that they never have financial illiteracy. So they never get indoctrinated into a life of perpetual slavery. Like that's the the ripple effect. That's the gift that keeps on giving. That's the the shade from life is about planting trees under whose shade will never sit. That's the life is not about what you get, it's about who you become. That's the and what you're able to give and now that you've become more. Does any of that make sense? So I'm excited man. And as you can see, we made it through. I don't know if this is my longest lecture today. I really hope it was. I was really trying to hit the three hour mark, I'll be honest, um, because that's just a testament to what I'm willing to give within this university. And I know this is what I cannot wait to do, especially from the idea that do what you need to do as quickly as possible so you can spend the majority of your life doing what you want to do. I'm very excited when the personal development portion of these books is done and everybody has everything that they possibly need, every resource, lesson, tool, ideology, insights, you know, ancient wisdom, piece of knowledge, piece of literature that they could possibly need um, to be free forever. And then for me, so I could spend the rest of my life doing what I actually want to do, which I just want to read all of the classical literature. And both classics in terms of ancient Greece, ancient Roman classics, but also classics like, you know, like the Scarlet Letter, I don't know, like uh, Call, of, Call of the Wild, I don't know. Like all of those classic books, like the Count of Monte Cristo and just, you know, where it's just fiction as well as nonfiction and not just, you know, you know, uh, uh, atomic habits or rich dad, poor dad or these kind of things. So until then, you're embarked on this noble quest with me. This is Rat Life University. Anyone can escape. It starts with belief and the courage to pursue. That is Rat Life. My name is Professor Tarek Alexander Hauks. And we are all going to make it. That is book number 21. Next time will be Law from the 48 Laws of Power, number 11. So stay tuned and have a great day. <laughs> See you guys.